Good afternoon again. Good afternoon in Europe and good morning in North America. I would like to welcome you all to the conference NATO 2030 in NATO Private Sector Dialogues with Globsec, an initiative that is both timely, crucial and innovative. This new partnership between NATO and Globsec will help to inform Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg's thinking on the role of private sector actors and provide input to the 2030 agenda reflections and related recommendations for the next leader summit. We are living in unprecedented times, not only in light of the ongoing pandemic. Our security landscape and the threats underscoring it are changing faster than governments and alliances can match them. New non-traditional threats keep looming on the horizon and we constantly look for ways to counter their effects and impact. In the same time, technology continues to develop at an unprecedented pace and be integrated into our daily lives of citizens around the world. New and disruptive tech fundamentally changes the security and defense landscape, as we have already seen. The domains of artificial intelligence, autonomy and big data are reshaping the basic applications of both the internet the software, and that's leading to a further integration of digital technology into security policy. In our Globsec report on the security environment that we have launched in 2018, led by General John Allen and the number of leaders from across the Atlantic, we have proposed that NATO should look into artificial intelligence and new technologies and create mechanisms to adapt to technological disruption. Two years later, a lot has been done, and I'm glad to see that NATO is increasingly considering the technological disruption as one of the fundamental challenges to our security. Beyond the link between digital and security, we see even closer relationship between international security and economic security. Their interdependence trend is accelerated by the interconnectedness of civilian and military domains, shared vulnerabilities, reliance on critical infrastructure and technology and propagation of the dual-use digital technology. Research and development in defense represent some of the best-funded government-sponsored projects, mainly on the American part of the Atlantic. The private sector remains the driving force for innovation and primary producer of breakthrough technologies. Amid such complex background, it is natural for NATO and its allies to want to leverage the private sector's dynamism and ingenuity to consider these questions in a dialogue with the private sector. Today's conference is just the start of this process. Today we will hear from experts from across the alliance on the future of AI and closing the gap between knowledge and capabilities on the role of small and big private sector in defining security in 2030 and the venture capital's role in allied defense and security. We will continue in the first part of 2021 with six additional smaller size dialogues on the following topics. The private sector contribution to alliance security, the green innovation in defense, the future of internet in a contested geopolitical environment transatlantic cooperation, ethical deployment and governance of new technologies, critical infrastructure and security of supply of change. More information to come, and please follow the Globsec website and social media for updates. Before giving the floor to our first keynote speaker, I would like to remind you all that you can engage also via social media by using the hashtag NATO2030 and hashtag Globsec to submit comments and questions. Those of you who are on the platform, please use the Q&A function for interaction. Without any further ado, I would like to invite NATO's Deputy Secretary General Mirsa Geoana to share his views on how we prepare today as NATO to maintain the technological edge tomorrow. Dear Deputy Secretary General, it is uh, my great honor to welcome you and look forward to hearing what is NATO doing in this regard. The floor is yours.
thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you to Globsec for partnering with uh, NATO to host these crucial private sector dialogues under the banner of NATO 2030. And I'm delighted to kick off this series of events, which will explore the role of the private sector and the role the private sector should play in making our stronger alliance even stronger. Today, for the next decade and beyond. The reason we are unable to meet in person is, of course, due to the coronavirus. This health crisis has changed the global landscape in ways we could barely have imagined a year ago. It has forced us to think the way we live, the way we work, to adapt, and yes, to innovate, and to seize the opportunities technology offers to find solutions to our most pressing challenges. And today's virtual dialogue is a great example of this. The pandemic is not the only thing having a dramatic impact on our societies. We are on the cusp of uninhabitable technology, cha technological change at a pace we have never witnessed before. The coronavirus is often referred to as a black swan event, high impact but highly improbable, whereas emerging technology is more like a grey rhino, high impact and highly likely. We all see it coming. Ignoring it, it will be at our own peril. The small, small smartphone in your pocket is only just entering its uh, teenage period. It was, I think, 13 years ago the first iPhone was issued. But it already has hundreds of thousands of times more processing power than the one NASA computers had when put the first man on the moon. Technology has always been key to deterrence and defense. From the bow and arrow, to the battle tank, the machine gun to the nuclear missile. Technological dominance has ensured our supremacy on and off the battlefield. Throughout our 70-year history, NATO allies have dominated this race. But today, that dominance is being challenged by countries who do not share our values or play by the same rules. Nations like Russia and China are racing to develop new technologies from hypersonic missiles to autonomous systems, to artificial intelligence and cyber warfare. We cannot risk a second Sputnik moment where we suddenly find ourselves outpaced and, God forbid, outgunned. We have to continue to, complete in this, to compete in this new battle space where conflicts are as defined as much by bytes and big data as by bullets and battleships. In a world where digital borders matter as much as physical ones, our sovereignty is not just about geography anymore, and our security is no longer assured by military means and actors alone. As the pandemic has highlighted, so much of the security we take for granted depends on thriving economies and, yes, resilient societies, able to adapt, to bounce back and innovate. We rely on civilian infrastructure to ensure our military operations, not only the roads, railroads, or ports to ensure military mobility, but increasingly the undersea cables and overhead satellites that allow us to operate, communicate, navigate. Patterns of innovation are also changing. Traditionally, developments in defense technology have been driven by the military sector, large defense corporations and governments, from nuclear to GPS and to the Internet. But today, it is often the private sector universities and startups that lead the way. Artificial intelligence, facial recognition, biotech, big data. These are extraordinary technologies that have the potential to make a revolution out of our lives and tackle of our most intractable problems, from curing disease and tackling climate change to rebuilding our economies. But they also have the potential to transform the way future wars will be waged and ultimately won we must make sure that these new technologies work for us and not against us, or worse, for our competitors. Our future security depends on our ability to understand, to adopt and implement emerging and disruptive technologies, and also at the speed and at scale. So it is essential that NATO allies redouble our efforts to maintain our technological edge. Because our 30 allies have an abundance of world-class universities, the finest researchers, innovative startups, and a mature, well-resourced financial ecosystem. We have indeed also open societies that are so conducive for innovation and talent retention. 
Yes, we do have ta great talent to tap into, from Silicon Valley to the Baltics to Central and Southeast Europe. All 30 allies have something to offer in this great endeavor, and huge potential to deepen transatlantic cooperation and synergies even further. Our open democracies, educational models, they all bring levels of creativity and disruption that other forms of governments cannot. Large companies compete with startups to generate, to generate fresh thinking. This drives innovation, encourages healthy competition, and builds societal resilience. It creates a competitive advantage that close societies cannot offer. NATO is at the forefront of innovation across our alliance. When they last met in December 19, uh, 2019 in London, NATO leaders endorsed a roadmap on emerging and disruptive technologies, and we are now working on a strategy for its implementation. We have produced important white papers on artificial intelligence, autonomous technologies, quantum and biotechnologies, which are helping to shape our policy decisions. We have a long-standing engagement with industry through NATO's Industry Forum. In NATO, I chair the Innovation Board, which coordinates policy and cooperation on innovation across the NATO enterprise. And we have appointed an advisory group of exceptionally bright experts and intellectuals and leaders of emerging and disruptive technologies, which feeds into this very board of innovation in NATO. And I'm delighted that Silvia Seres, who sits on this group, is joining us today in this conference. Our science and technology organization runs a network of over 6,000 scientists and engineers dedicated to integrating the most advanced technolo technologies into NATO and allied platforms. This is the largest ecosystem of the sort in the world. Such as next generation early warning aircraft and autonomous maritime minesweepers. Our plans to replace NATO's early warning aircraft in 2035 include many of the technologies we are talking about today such as autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, or big data. So NATO is already preparing today to maintain our technological edge tomorrow. But we can and must do more. We are facing a new technological race, the race to implement and adopt new technologies at speed and at scale. This means having the right people, the right money, and the right structures in place. So these are some of the questions I hope you will address in your dialogue today. How can we develop innovation ecosystems, including a NATO across the Alliance innovation ecosystem, novel financing mechanisms, and a resilient innovation pipeline across the Alliance? How can we better partner with the private sector, large and small, to learn from best practice and seize opportunities while mitigating risk? How, and how can we embed our values, our values, our most fundamental ingredient, keeping this great alliance of ours into this formidable state for the last seven decades or so? How can we embed values in our technology, a technology that is shaping our world through standards for the safe and ethical use of AI, implementing new technologies quickly and at scale, and in line with our values, this is not just about maintaining our technological edge. It is about ensuring our peace and security and the kind of freedom we have in our societies for many generations to come. Whether and which tech to pursue is ultimately not only a commercial, but a political choice. It has profound implications for our strategic direction and for our security and for the one billion citizens that are living in NATO countries. In the past, these choices were largely the preserve of governments. But increasingly, they are made or shaped by the private sector. This is why the public sector needs to be more tech-ready. And the tech sector needs to be more security-ready. As NATO allies, we need to think about what kind of technology and what kind of technologies we need to keep us safe in the future. And the private sector, uh, we encourage them, and I encourage you, to think about what kind of societies they want to serve in 2030 and beyond. This is why this series of dialogues are so timely and so very important. I do not promise, and I do not think we should expect from one dialogue to have all the answers. But through the private sector dialogues, we hope to ask the right questions and shape the right answers. 
And again, uh, we are so privileged to, to, to partner with you for the NATO 2030 uh, vision of Secretary General Stoltenberg, because staying strong militarily, becoming stronger politically, and having a more global NATO in what we do, in the kind of topics we embrace, and here, technology and new technologies are the heart of our enduring success of an alliance. Thank you so much for making this alliance strong and also even stronger for 2030 and beyond. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, for your really thought-provoking speech. It is reassuring to know that NATO is preparing today to maintain its technological edge tomorrow. But as Deputy Secretary General said, we must do more. And the private sector and academia will be a crucial part of this. Let me highlight a few points uh, from your speech. First, you said that we are witnessing technological change happening at an unprecedented pace, and we ignore current uh, changes at our peril. We need to ensure that we do understand the implications of the technological change. Second, you said that throughout the 70-year history, NATO allies have dominated this race. But today, that dominance is being challenged by countries who do not share our values or play by the same rules. The third point I would like to highlight, maybe, is that our security is no longer assured only by military means and actors alone. And we need to ensure that we are all are part of it. Fourth, technologies that have the potential to transform the way uh, the future wars will be waged and ultimately won. The future warfare and the rules of military engagement will no longer be a given. And the last point uh, that I would like to highlight uh, that, uh, from your speech is that today uh, it is often the private sector, universities and startups that lead the way on innovation, new tools, new groundbreaking research. That is why we want to encourage deeper interaction between the alliance and the private sector through these dialogues. But while we are, uh, while we keeping all these in mind, we need to be realistic uh, and know the challenges, uh, what challenges lie ahead of us. We need to have the right people, money, structures in place. Our future security depends on our ability to understand, adapt and implement emerging and disruptive technologies. We also uh, need to implement new technologies quickly and at scale and in line with our values. Because it is not just about maintaining our technological edge. It is about ensuring our peace and security now and for generations to come. So the key questions for today are, how can we develop innovation ecosystems, novel financing mechanisms, and resilient innovation pipeline across the alliance. How can we better partner with the private sector, large and small, to learn from the best practices, to size the opportunities while maintaining risks? And how can we embed our values into the technology that is already shaping our world, including through standards of the safe and ethical use of AI? I hope today we will hear some answers to these uh, questions. And next in the agenda, we have a showcase presentation on AI and warfare by Dr. Herr Blin, senior research scholar and fellow in cyber policy and security at the Howard Institution, Stanford University. It will be then followed by the first panel on the future of AI bridging the knowledge and the capability gap led by Aline Chivot uh, of Center for Data Innovation. Thank you very much, and I hope uh, you will enjoy the, today's discussion and see you in the course of the day. Hello. Can can people hear me? Ah, thank you. Uh, I am delighted to be here. Thank you. My name is Herb Lynn, and as previously said, I am from Stanford uh, University, um, and, and uh, I am greatly honored to to, to be here. Uh, I'm here 
to, with a somewhat contrarian view of AI in uh, military applications and in uh, and in, in warfare, uh, I, I'd like to just start out by by saying that despite what you will you are about to to hear, uh, I do support uh, AI as a uh, technology that is worth uh, investigating. But I want to uh, please take this talk as as a, a set of uh, cautions and warnings. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, all seen these kinds of applications as being promising for uh, for where AI is uh, intended to be uh, in, in introduced. Um, uh, autonomous uh, and semi-autonomous vehicles, sometimes with the possibility of, of making kill decisions, carrying, uh, carrying out lethal autonomous operations on, on their own. That's more controversial at, at, at this point. Um, command and control is certainly an, an area of application, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and, and reconnaissance, logistics, cyberspace operations, and, and information. This is a standard list that many people uh, talk about. Next slide, please. Okay. I'd like to ask you, have you ask yourselves three, the, the following three questions here, uh, which uh, just, you know, take, take, take a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll read them, but uh, th think about these. Uh, do you think that AI will lead to more understanding or less understanding of the battle space, or what's going on? Um, will AI uh, reduce uh, or increase the number of mistakes made in, uh, in, in, in targeting? Uh, and where do you think the most strategically important defense applications uh, are, are going to uh, be um, in civilian or operations, uh, sorry, in the civilian-like operations like logistics and, and so on, or in the uh, sharp edge of, of weapon systems. So think about that. Uh, there will be a poll, there will be polls, uh, a poll taken on this as, as we go on, and uh, I understand that you can put in your answers uh, in, in the poll as, uh, as, as the talk continues. Next slide, please. Okay, so I want to point out, let me start out by, with a, a proposition that AI is lousy at explaining itself. Uh, mostly, the, there there was an AI uh, a, 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 a thrust of artificial intelligence in in, in the 70s and 80s, uh, based on uh, rule based systems. Today, the state of the art of, of uh, AI is machine uh, machine learning. What we call supervised machine learning depends on labeled training data. That is. Uh, data that uh, human beings have uh, have labeled, and then the machine is supposed to find quote similar unquote patterns and, and make statistical inferences about uh, uh, inputs. Um, unsupervised machine learning is supposed to find clusters uh, in unlabeled data that otherwise go unnoticed uh, if examined by humans. Um, uh, but I'll tell you that uh, it will not. It will never be able to tell you, give you the names of what those clusters mean. Uh, so it will find, it'll say, hey, here's an interesting uh, uh, outlier to his, some pattern, uh, but it's up to the human being to interpret what it might mean. Uh, machine, I'm going to make a, the following proposition, that machine learning systems are basically unable to explain to human users what the conclusions uh, are that they, that, that they make. The fundamental reason is that AI is correlation. Oh, sorry, machine learning is correlation. It's statistical. Uh, and correlation, we all learn in statistics courses that correlation is not causation, and yet causality is required for an explanation. Moreover, human explanation of the path from input to output doesn't give you very much insight about uh, what it was about the input that gave you, that led you to the inference uh, that, uh, that you're wondering about. Um, and you know, remember that that statistical reasoning gives you inferences about populations, not about individuals. It may change your prior beliefs about the individuals and, and so on, but it doesn't give you conclusions about individuals directly. Uh, mostly, it, it only gives you in, inferences about uh, populations. And if you don't, if you don't have the ability to explain yourself. Uh, it is one impossible to, to understand the errors that do occur, and uh, two, uh, it, it may make you question uh, the novel but brilliant inferences that the uh, machine makes. So you, you may remember the, uh, a little while ago, uh, an AI system uh, played Go, 
And on move 37, uh, it made a very, very surprising move. And a lot of people thought it was an error. Uh, but And they puzzled over it for a very long time. It turned out to be a, a brilliant uh, move. Um, but it was very confusing to people at the time. And it's interesting uh, to, to question or to wonder uh, what would have happened if that had been a, uh, uh, a decision support system that had recommended a particular move, which nobody quite understood. Uh, would they people with people with commanders in the field have just trusted it uh, or, or would they have puzzled over it and, 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 and so on? Okay, next slide, please. Okay. In a military context, we, we know that the enemy gets a vote in any battle. Uh, no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, and, and machine learning systems are, 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 are trained uh, on the hypothetical data uh, that, that military priors predict what the contact uh, with the enemy will entail. So, you know, the, it raises some interesting questions here. How will the machine learning system uh, perform when real contact with the enemy is different from the assumptions built into the training data? Uh, how will the machine uh, learning system know that it's being asked to perform outside its range of competence? It's, after all, it's trained on a certain body of data. If something is very far outside that, uh, range you wouldn't expect it to work very well. How will it know? And, and there, you know that those, that's a a, a a challenging problem. You might ask a question. You know, why did a certain automatic target recognition system identify a bulldozer as a tank? Why did a decision support us recommend moving a battalion from you know to a point A rather than point B on the battlefield and and and, and so on? Um, you need to know the answers to these questions before you're going to trust the uh, uh, output. Um, and especially if you're being called to, to account for a possible violation of the laws of war. Next slide, please. Okay. So we know, we also know that AI, uh, machine learning, sorry, um, can be can sometimes be easily tricked and and, uh, and and hacked. So you can consider adversary inputs in, in computer vision. This is uh, from a. Uh, 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 a paper a couple of years ago, you start with the image on the left and the system identifies it as a sloth with 99% uh, uh, confidence. And then uh, you transform it uh, into a race car, uh, quote, transform in step two, that's what you want it to look like. And then you create an adversarial image on the right by very, very, very subtly altering the image. At least I can't tell the difference between the picture on the left or the picture on the right, and yet the system tells you that the system, that the uh, item on the right, the picture on the right, is a um, is a race car. Uh, now that's a bad outcome uh, for a uh, an automatic uh, image recognizer, and you can imagine difficulties with this on the uh, on, on, on the on, on the battlefield. Next slide, please. So, for example, you might consider uh, a, a scenario in which a uh, uh, machine uh, learning enabled image classification system uh, confuses the reflection of a gunshot muzzle from firing from uh, a, uh, a window of a building, let's say a hospital, from gunshots coming from inside the hospital itself. And the answer, the conclusion matters, right? It matters whether the system thinks that it's coming from a hospital or thinks that it's not coming from a hospital. Uh, and, and this is a dangerous situation. And how do you deal with it, with, with this kind of, of, uh, of, of problem? Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, we, uh, the, the, our, our keynote talked about uh, values, and, and values are often embedded in the uh, laws of uh, arm, arm, armed conflict. I worry about a race to the bottom. Uh, AI is a technology, but also, but you know, kinetic combat entails not just technology, uh, but you know how they're going to be used and the rules of engagement and so on. And I posit the following: the West is going to build uh, its AI systems uh, to, with its interpretations of, of the laws of armed conflict, and our adversaries will build their AI-driven weapon systems with their own interpretations. So let's imagine that both sides have roughly equal levels of technology. Whose weapon systems will have greater levels of military effectiveness? I posit that the side, uh, that, that, that the advantage will go to the side with the looser LOAC uh, interpretations. 
Uh, and we saw a precedent of this in World War II when we had unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, and, and, and this was a, uh, something that was banned by treaty uh, in 1930 because of the experiences of World War I. Uh, and yet both sides ignored it in World War II because, it confer because the uh, technology uh, proved so overwhelmingly advantageous only if you maintain the secrecy uh, of uh, the, the stealth of the uh, of, of, of the vehicle. Um, our choices in this in, in this context in, in, in an AI world is to accept lower levels of military uh, lower levels of military effectiveness, um, which is unacceptable on the battlefield. Um, we can develop better technology. Uh, which we're going to be trying to do anyway. We're always going to be trying to keep ahead, and so is the other guy. Uh, and to relax our own low act standards. I mean, I think that I fear that this is the most likely outcome. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Okay. There's also the uh, question. Next slide, please. This is also the question of, 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 of escalation. And because we consider, for example, that uh, the training, because the training for uh, machine list learning systems will never fully capture uh, the range of real, of real world inputs, pe so people don't realize that machine learning systems uh, are maybe out, operating outside the scope of their training data. Um, they may have no reason to question user inputs regarding self-assessment of, of capabilities and, and so on. Uh, they may recommend uh, escalation uh, in, in way, as a, a way of, of uh, achieving victory uh, based on essentially fault, what are essentially faulty assumptions. Um, you could also imagine machine learning systems that uh, undertake actions that, that narrowly optimize the, the achievement of particular design specs at the expense of the human uh, in, intended goal. Uh, so maybe it'll recommend a bat, you know, taking certain actions that will uh, win a battle uh, without recognizing the potential for inadvertent escalation. Next slide, please. On excessive trust in AI, I worry about this a lot. We've been talking about how AI, many people talk about how AI is an uh, enabling technology for the future. Uh, AI, the idea is that AI will be ubiquitously embedded in every, in, in all sorts of uh, devices and infrastructure. And by definition, ubiquitous applications are not novel. Uh, that is, the, the, tech, the underlying technology is, 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 is not novel. And user skepticism, which is what protects us against my, many of the excesses of technology, uh, depend, and in AI too, uh, depends in large part on, on, on novelty. So reduction in skepticism will lead to, in my view, uh, excessive trust in AI-driven systems. More mistakes will occur. Uh, and we won't recognize, the worry is that we won't recognize them as such when they, when, when, when they do occur. Next slide, please. So I'm going to posit that the most important AI defense military applications today are the lower stakes ones and not flashy, not the, not the weapons and not the command and control. At least for present day technology, uh, the advantage is going to come where we can deal with the boring stuff, uh, the administration, management, logistics has its own, better healthcare, uh, lo uh, procurement and, 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 and so on. Um, uh, and if you can do this, then you're going to be able, you're going to achieve better tooth to tail ratios. That is, the, uh, you're going to free up personnel to actually engage in, uh, in, in, in combat and, and, and so on. Uh, the civilians, and the reason here, is, is, and why do I want to emphasize this? Because the civilian sector is also working on many of these applications. And of course, we know that the military sector has to do a lot of things that the civilian sector does to, to maintain. Uh, it, its performance uh, edges, uh, and the military and civilian efforts there can support each other. It's not just the development of the, of the technology, that's important, uh, but it's in the nature of the applications. Uh, and I'd, I'd say, suggest that civilian-oriented efforts to develop applications are by and large not well matched to support uh, military-specific applications by definition. Uh, but if you can have civilians in, uh, you know, doing stuff that uh, working on applications that the military can use, there's a big win uh, in that. Next slide, please. 
Okay. Okay, I want to offer some guidelines for uh, AI and military applications. Uh, and, and I recognize that some of these are, are, are somewhat controversial uh, in, in the sense that they, they go, they say, don't, don't take advantage of the revolution. Uh, and, and so let me, I'm happy to talk about this here. I mean, think of machine learning as being statistical rather than smart. Okay, so think about it as something that's useful for understanding populations rather than individual cases. Focus on explainability. Explainability is a critical, really, really, really important part of, of, of new systems. Um, you want to, I suggest you may want to meld the old paradigms of, of rule-based AI uh, with uh, statistical uh, reasoning and, and, and so on. And I'd say aim for incremental improvement rather than uh, revolutionary improvement. Um, 10, remember that 10 times 10 percent annual improvement in seven years doubles uh, doubles your performance. Uh, that is, after all, what Moore's law is based on. Uh, get your 10 percent uh, and try to do that year after year. Going going in for a factor of 10 every you know out, out of the box uh, is, uh, is is a really tough challenge. Um, Gain experience in where in low stakes environment where if you make a mistake it doesn't matter very much. Um, right on the battlefield is where it really, really matters, and, and, and uh, you don't want to make your mistakes uh, there. Be able to define success uh, and failures when you see it. That's going to take a lot of work to, to know what it means to, to where, when a system is successful. Always ask what could go wrong and never ex accept what the vendor says uh, is going to, to happen. Don't trust the vendor. I want to close with two with with, with the with, with uh, two thoughts here. Okay, uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, next. Uh, there are three roads to ruin. Okay, Techno alcohol is the fastest. Sex is the most fun. Technology is the most certain. Before setting up this phone call, I had to engage in a. Uh, in, in a test phone call uh, yesterday to, 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 to be here to make sure all the technology worked right. Um, I still, when I first came in, I still had trouble uh, hearing the, uh, the, the, the speaker. Every one of you has seen the, the, the speaker fumble with a projector and a uh, PC uh, getting his slides up. Um, those problems are problems that we should be able to solve and they're trivial problems. Uh, and yet we waste infinite amounts of time every year trying to deal with uh, those, those problems, wasted in meetings and, and, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, oh, so, yeah, okay. Um, I, I'm going to, one of the things which I've learned in, in, in all of this is that AI is something you call, is what you call something that doesn't quite work and you don't understand it very well. Uh, it works more often than not, but not all of the time. On the other hand, you can't predict when it'll work and you therefore shouldn't have high confidence that it does work. Uh, and when it, does, when it doesn't work, and even when it does, you don't understand why it did or didn't work, and you don't know how to make it any better. Now, I emphasize the word no there because we've all, you know, consider, we've all had the experience of calling up a help desk, and the help desk says, well, let's try this. If that doesn't work, we'll try that, and we'll do try this. And if that doesn't work, we'll try this something else, right? Every one of you has had that experience. I've had that experience many times. What that tells me is that the guy at the other end of the help desk who knows a lot, who's supposed to know more about IT than I do, he's not expressing knowledge about system, the system. He's expressing a hope that this thing will work. Uh, and, and that's not really what you want on, 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 on the battlefield. So I, I tend to approach all of this stuff with a, a certain degree of, 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 of skepticism. Now, I, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is my contact information, and if anybody wants to, to talk to me about this more, please do. Um, uh, I, I, I was uh, told that I, I should t say a little bit about Stanford. Uh, the Stanford Human-Centered uh, AI Initiative uh, is intended to deal with some of the unintended consequences of AI. Uh, so, for example, a classic thing that we're trying to do, deal with is algorithmic bias. Um, nobody anticipated algorithmic bias uh, in, in, uh, when we first, um, when the system became 
uh, first uh, known. So there are things that they, you know, algorithmic biases, things like uh, an image recognition system recognizing gorillas as, uh, as sorry, um, looking at uh, at a person of, a, of a, an image of a black person uh, and, and identifying it as a gorilla. Uh, absolutely unacceptable uh, and, and um, how do you correct algorithms and data to, to deal with that kind of problem? So a lot of the, what uh, the AI, the HAI at, the, uh, at Stanford is doing is in dealing with that kind of, uh, of problem. And then the, the, the last point is, is on academic, you know, academia industry and, and, and government, how to, uh, how to have all of them engaged. I submit that mostly, the, not mostly, but one of the major issues is in getting the, the institutional buy-in to do that. It's not... Yes, there's of course of money in, in in grants and contracts and and so on, but it's very very difficult to, in my experience, to get the academics interested, uh, for example, in studying security issues. Um, it's been it's been hard. Uh, I I I'm a technologist myself, but I I I'm a somewhat anom anomalous in the academic in, environment. So providing uh, cross-fertilization in terms of interesting problems and so on is going to be very, very important uh, in getting engagement of the, uh, of the academic uh, community. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, those are my remarks. Thank you for uh, being here and thank you for listening. Thanks very much. Welcome everyone to this session as part of uh, GlobSec and NATO's conference on the future of warfare and the role of new and emerging uh, technologies. My name is Edine Chivo and I am Senior Policy Analyst uh, at the Center for Data Innovation, a Brussels and DC based think tank active in, in tech policy. Today I'm with you to moderate a panel on the future of AI, bridging the knowledge and capability gap. I will first introduce our guests before we dive into the conversation uh, to participants following the discussion, which is being live streamed on Globsec's YouTube and Facebook pages, I believe. If you'd like to tweet and react on social media, please feel free to use the hashtag NATO2030 and Globsec and NATO's Twitter handles. Please also send us questions as uh, we will ensure there is some time for uh, interaction between our, our speakers today and the audience. You can post your questions um, either uh, via the conference platform or via a video call into this virtual studio. Now to set the scene first and perhaps uh, to give us all food for thought for the conversation that will follow, um, artificial intelligence is certainly not a new technology, but the consequences of AI automated systems on the conduct of future operations and conflict in general are yet to be fully understood. Now AI is in the radar of many, of many countries and organizations and some countries are racing ahead and others behind uh, when it comes to capabilities, standards, building blocks necessary for AI, there are discrepancies, including among the members of the uh, Alliance. Uh, on the other side, AI is a developing policy and operational field in many organizations themselves, including NATO. But the Alliance already uh, is seeking to address these questions through planning and decision making and also to prepare for the potential threat posed by um, malign actors in possession of uh, high-tech capabilities. By bringing together a diversity of stakeholders, NATO can play a significant role to deepen the understanding of the tools and levers available within the Alliance so that we can bridge the gaps uh, in AI development on both sides of the Atlantic uh, between member countries and between NATO and private sector organizations. Now, why is AI an excellent topic for transatlantic cooperation uh, and within the alliance? And why is NATO uh, a promising, natural and efficient platform to address the challenges and the opportunities? With me today to discuss, uh, we have David Von Veil, uh, Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges at NATO. 
Eva Kaili, she's a member of the European Parliament for the Socialists and Democrats Party, and she's also chair of the Center for AI and chair of the delegation to the NATO PA in Parliament, among many other things. Michael Hunter is co-founder and CEO of Fuse AI, which is a Washington DC-based tech startup that focuses on uh, solving hard AI and machine learning problems for the national security industry. And we have Anes Numa, a digital transformation advisor at eEstonia. Welcome all of you and thank you so much for, for joining. I'd like to start the conversation just by kicking off straight away with a, a question, perhaps starting with you, uh, David, Van Veel. Um, in a nutshell, for, first part of my question would just be maybe you have a reaction as to whether you'd agree with the Deputy Secretary General who recently said that NATO is a natural uh, platform for transatlantic cooperation of AI. Now, why do you think uh, he said that? And, and secondly, uh, there are various challenges that NATO can address when it comes to AI. And one is um, this knowledge gap uh, between the private and the public sector. And I was wondering if you can identify that there is such a gap and, and, and if so, how could NATO act, uh, you know, as a facilitator for, for change, innovation and, and, and more to, to help bridge this. The floor is yours. Thank you, Eileen. And, and of course, I'm going to agree with my new boss in three weeks, uh, the, 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 the Deputy Secretary General, when he says that NATO is an excellent platform uh, for transatlantic cooperation on AI. Um, but I have something to back that up as well. I think that as we're watching the world and we're watching our society slowly adapt to artificial intelligence, the expectation uh, that governments and, 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 and the defense uh, will follow in this development uh, uh, is growing. And I think we have a lot of work to do uh, when it comes down to getting to grips with what AI means uh, uh, for uh, the alliance as a whole, but also for the member uh, states involved, uh, and how we're going to address this. Um, in saying that, I mean, the bulk of the innovation being done in the field of AI uh, happens in, in NATO member states. So harnessing that power of knowledge uh, uh, in order to build up our system within NATO on how we view AI and how we become a trusted user and partner in AI, I think is, 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 a, is a great opportunity. And, and I'm grateful that I'm one of the uh, people that, that can play a small role in, uh, in, in setting this up. Uh, that being said, there is, I think, a lot to be done. Uh, NATO is just starting to get to grips with uh, AI as a topic. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, framework work to be done uh, before we talk about what the last speaker uh, had in his presentation, which is actually using AI uh, in uh, a kinetic way in the battlefield. Uh, I think we are uh, starting out in the dialogue phase in getting to grips with what AI means, uh, in uh, starting out on the principles of use, uh, what are our values that we take into AI, uh, what do we think is important, uh, do we trust uh, NATO uh, with the data that is a crucial uh, part of AI, Etc. Uh, uh, Etc. Et so there's uh, many questions to be answered, uh, but in my view, NATO is is is, is well set uh, to to play a convening role in 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 this important discussion. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I'd like to turn to to you, MEP Eva Kaili. Thanks again for joining us. Um, you you probably have something to to uh, you maybe would like to react to what David said about how you know NATO can be a trusted partner in AI. Maybe you have some insights on whether EU policymakers do view uh, NATO as such, and how do they already work together? I know that you know there, there are regulatory frameworks developed in the EU uh, and and elsewhere. Uh, maybe they can be helpful to, to bridge this knowledge uh, and capability gap we identify. Uh, maybe there are convergences and divergences uh, among, you know, between members of the alliance and between what the EU is doing. I don't know. Maybe you'd have some, some thoughts to contribute. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for um, giving me the floor and such an interesting uh, topic that we are able to discuss. So uh, I believe, uh, first of all, that AI is part of the way we should uh, collaborate to address um, um, any threat. We have, of course, now um, new technologies that we have to be able to, um, uh, to, to defend ourselves from. 
um, since the hybrid threats are, are much uh, smarter and the technologies that are being developed, um, they don't follow rules at this point. Uh, we are still struggling in Europe to present a legal framework for these technologies. But I think for the time being, NATO and EU are not even ready to, um, to face uh, current challenges so um, uh, to develop an AI strategy would actually be very important, um, related, of course, to, uh, in any case, to the misuse of, uh, of AI automated systems. So I think we need to restructure um, our collaboration, but also ourselves, and have um, a stronger partnership together. So um, in, in Europe, defense is still a national prerogative, and the terrorism has still no borders uh, and the process of integration is too slow and have, has been challenged uh, with Brexit and uh, of course now with the pandemic as you saw at uh, the same time NATO lacks of a system of deterrence and enforcement. Um, I can mention issues we can discuss later, the role of Turkey and also um, having a NATO member uh, purchasing S-400 from, from Russia um, the same time, um, NATO has some shortcomings that it has to address. So now that we're living in a, in a different system, in a multipolar uh, system, we definitely have to strengthen on specific uh, values and principles our, our collaboration. So I think since we are both in the process of developing this strategy for these emerging technologies and threats, it's a great opportunity to find where and how we can collaborate uh, together. Um, we, you know that uh, the European Parliament actually has uh, strengthened its voice and its uh, influence into forming a European defence strategy. And also we are now developing all the legislation for the AI and the data that fuels the AI systems in order to take down the barriers and, and uh, move into more uh, more integrated market, a real digital uh, single market. Um, the approach would be um, to have more security criteria for high risk applications and high risk sectors. Defense, of course, would uh, be a top priority there. Um, so uh, I believe instead of uh, forming strategies on our own ways, it would be great if we start collaborating now to set common standards and uh, decide uh, how this partnership can be formed and, and join forces under specific principles. So I think it's a great uh, opportunity uh, because uh, this uh, threat, uh, the hybrid threats and the threats that are coming from the emerging technologies uh, really um, uh, go beyond borders. And I think the platform of the Trans Atlantic uh, Organization of, of NATO um, could be um, a great uh, way to, to start building uh, bridges among systems that uh, uh, we can agree at least we should and uh, we have already defended ourselves. So um, I see a great potential, but uh, definitely um, uh, when we continue the discussion, I can also tell you how we developed that, what are the initiatives we took in the Parliament and the Commission and see how more specifically we can uh, strengthen this partnership with centers of excellence for, for defense and AI. Um, I, I think we are both trying to do that, but it would be great if we uh, uh, start discussing how they can be complementary already before we have all developed our different strategies. Thank you so much. There's a lot uh, that to unpack in what you said, and, and you're absolutely right. There is uh, oftentimes uh, an issue of interoperability of even you know the standards, and, and maybe a good way uh, to uh, overcome that would be to discuss those standards before they're baked in strategies. So that would be more efficient to then and, and easy, more uh, easy to collaborate later on. Uh, so thanks a lot. And, and I have a follow-up question, if I may, because you rightly mentioned member states. Um, you know, it's their prerogative still when it comes to security and defense. And you know, the framework that the Commission is building does not include the use of AI in military and defense. Do you think, though, that it should, that it's the job, you know, still the Commission to try and, and, and integrate that, that element uh, when it comes to AI? Do you think they should? 
Well, actually, um, we say that we don't want to support investments in autonomous lethal weapon systems, but this is one thing, and we are trying to avoid any technology that we invest in to be um, at risk of being exported into states that can use it against us. So this is one thing, but in the meantime, we actually have um, decided to set up the European Defence Fund and 5% 5% of its budget is going to disruptive technologies. So I wouldn't say we, we avoid to, to, uh, to talk about uh, common defence. And uh, we have uh, the common security and defence policy. We have the permanent uh, structured cooperation defence where we have 17 projects that are ongoing. And some of them, they have to do with cyber responses and security coordination, information and monitoring. And everything around that is about data and this data can be used in AI systems. So it depends how you use them. So I would say we're actually really already involved um, as the parliament, as, as the European Union in um, how we can join forces uh, to, to set up like a European defense strategy. But of course, we also try to take under consideration the national strategies and, as I said, the, uh, the way to be uh, in collaboration with NATO and not, and not overlapping. Thank you uh, very much, uh, MEP Kaili. Uh, let me turn to, uh, to you, Michael uh, Hunter of Fuse AI. Can I, can I call you Mike? Mike's fine. Okay, thanks. Thanks for joining us. So um, I'm sure we'll we'll go back to some of the points that uh, Eva Kaidi raised because there were many interesting things there. But you do also have a lot of interesting experience to share as you've been working uh, with the national security industry in the United States. So what is your view on how you know NATO could work with the private sector? What is so great about it when it does? How does it help in addressing gaps in, in AI go uh, development, governance? Uh, you know, how does that strengthen mutual engagement on uh, what's going on between both sides of the Atlantic when it comes to, to AI? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we're working the policy angle, and, and I think that's something that's that's very important to be to be understood and to be agreed upon by all member nations. There's also this, you know, aspect of, of like, how do we actually start projects? How do we begin integrating AI into our actual platforms? Um, and that's where sort of the private industry comes in, right? You know, Technology is not built in many, largely by governments, right? It's built by private industry who then provide that to the, to the governments to use. So what we have to do is engage with the, the private sector quickly um, before we have uh, gone down the path of developing these, you know, legacy systems that are not built for AI, right? The biggest problem that we find with actually uh, implementing or integrating AI with current weapon systems or current, um, you know, non-weapon systems but support systems uh, is that they're just not not available or that AI is not able to be placed on top of it. You can't build this this uh, weapon system and then, you know, take some AI and place it on top of a, of a system and expect it to integrate in any in any effective way. So, you know, to the point of the that the member nations of NATO are sort of their independent bodies and have their own procurement ability and their own procurement authorities. Um, I think the, the massive thing that NATO can do is, is standardize, right? Standardize across the, the member nations, but also provide opportunities for uh, small business or large business um, to, to you know, spread their, uh, spread their capability across the, the various uh, states. So, you know, you've got a lot of opportunity here um, to both be a, you know, policy organization that uh, standardizes things and that builds that common framework, whether it's, you know, in data sharing, uh, test and evaluation, uh, critical elements like that, uh, but also providing business opportunities for small businesses to uh, begin the process of teaming with larger organizations is to uh, begin the process of teaming with larger organizations to actually uh, integrate AI into platforms from the beginning, as opposed to being this, you know, afterthought, right, this bolt on uh, concept uh, later on. So there's opportunities here. You know, one of the things that um, the US has experimented with is this concept of non-dilutive capital, right? Um, where you have organizations like the Defense Innovation Unit within the U.S. Um, that provides funding for, you know, small organizations. I think this has largely been, and this is my own opinion, uh, you know, not the DODs, this has largely been a failed experiment. Um, and the thing that, that NATO can provide is support with uh, contractual obligations, right? The best non-dilutive capital is, is contracts. Um, and so ensuring that there's a way to bring in smaller businesses, uh, bring in, uh, you know, competitors within this rather stagnated, uh, defense industry um, is going to be critical for the member nations. There's no easy answer for this, of course, right? This is not something that if, if there was easy, we would have already done it. 
Um, but but moving towards you know a, a situation where we've got more competition, um, more evolution, um, you know, iterating rapidly on capabilities as opposed to delivering things over ten to twenty years, um, is going to be critical for the for the future of this. You know, there's a lot that we can do now, even as the policy is being established, um, preparing uh, member nations with you know data sharing agreements. Um, again, going back to the test and evaluation, which is critical for that, you know, explainability and that building trust in the AI. So, so doing that now, um, while the, the policy framework is, is being established, I think is going to be something that the NATO Alliance really can, um, really can, can bring to the table. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, once again, very insightful uh, contribution, and I'm sure we'll get back to some of the things you said, uh, but before we do, Maybe to follow up, uh, Annette of Estonia, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, do you have the same critical view on, on, on how NATO can, can contribute and how it's working in terms of the collaboration with the private uh, sector? How do you think more broadly it could help, you know, to comply, um, it could help with when it comes to compliance for, for government use of AI systems, for instance, uh, in terms of supporting private sector companies in adopting their compliance program, this sort of things? Uh, so yes, first of all, thanks for having me here and thanks for CloopSec and NATO for organizing such an uh, interesting event and very actual and essential topic here. I think this is crystal clear that AI is already transforming the way we think about uh, and of course also plan different conflicts here. And AI en enabled systems and technologies are already being used by military industry for many, many years. So that's nothing new in the market. Uh, however, the NATO still faces the same threats and challenges. Therefore, I see a very huge potential, especially uh, cooperation in developing AI solutions in the defense sector, and always 100% also including the private sector there in a process. Uh, we know that today the Europe, European Union member states and NATO allies also have a very different approach when it comes to AI, and they are on completely different stages of thinking and developing the AI solutions, and how it also affects the entire security in the defense sector. However, I think that AI presents a, an excellent opportunity both for the European Union member states and the NATO forces because um, just to bring it out here, NATO has already had a very strong history in engagement in private industry in its planning and technology programs here. Um, but the problem re uh, that still remains here is that the government institutions and defense ministries do not have necessarily the right skills uh, which are needed in order to use the AI enabled technologies and I think this is the perfect time to look in the eyes of, of the private sector here and and just to uh, bring it out here as I'm representing Estonia here so already in the year 2016 Estonian Ministry of Defense and Defense also our defense forces here started cooperating with private sector and allocated also financial support uh, to some of the startups because we needed uh, to have some kind of also uh, solutions provided by the private sector but the NATO nations have uh, to reform their first of all procurement practices and involve also innovative industry at the very early pace of defense planning here. And also an important part of the European Union approach here is uh, to AI, uh, security and defense policies, the need to study it, this relationship between the public and private sector here. Um, because the private sector companies are extremely innovative and this may also confirm on them dominating when it comes to both designing, developing, deploying AI systems and technologies. But there is much more uh, than NATO could do here. And, and for example, NATO could provide also challenges and visibility to innovative defense industry to NATO's exercises, why not, or any uh, any kind of also war, ga war games here. Um, and what I could also recommend here is to incorporate innovative uh, challenges and novel technology demonstration into all the NATO exercises. And this is just one of the ways that NATO could uh, directly reach out to industry and bring also some of the stakeholders together in challenging the inspiring uh, settings right over here. And, and if I may also just to add some other examples from the Estonian side here, I'm always very flattered to see how actively the Estonian companies have been involved in the process here. Some of the startups uh, have very absolute genius ideas that have already transformed the real companies and um, to bring you some of the examples here, so Marduk Technologies, who has already con uh, contributed uh, to NATO defense against terrorism, and of course also Program of Work, Counter UAV, uh, with their ex expertise in this sector here. And they also help many of our airports in order to uh, uh, discover some of the specific objects by, by drone site there. 
And there is a couple of other examples also by the Milgram Robotics, uh, who has been engaged in NATO innovation operations. And of, of course, also they have contributed to different NATO industrial advisory groups and sciences and technologies uh, to study groups and projects. So this is exactly uh, the right way to make sure that most innovative ideas get the very right attention that's out there. So I'm encouraging both at the NATO and of course also the European Union to start working closer together with uh, the private sector. Thanks very much, Annette. Um, I wanted to have the reaction of, uh, of, of Mike, of, of you, Mike, again. Uh, we've heard a lot of interesting things here. Obviously, it's hard to pick, uh, you know, one or two things. But, you know, do you agree with, with, with Mike and, and Annette, uh, on, you know, on certain things like, you know, this, this need for to provide financial tools and how NATO can play a role in, uh, in helping SMEs and act as an organization that can set standards? And if so, what should those standards look like? Uh, is there a need to raise awareness about, you know, the opportunities for, for defense investment in AI tools? Uh, what about NATO acting to create contractual rights? Uh, what did you think of all these examples? Are they already happening? Uh, to a certain extent, um, obviously the the thing that NATO has been very good at from a from a technical perspective is the standardization agreements, right? This, the NATO standex that have proliferated across the alliance, right? So we we use those currently, um, and there's others examples of standardization, right? The five five six ammunition, um, just to name one. Uh, so I think that that absolutely, right? The 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 benefit of having an overarching organization like NATO is very similar to the construct that we've created in the U.S. of the Joint AI Center, right? There are certain things within AI that are common depending on whatever uh, you know AI project you're working on, whether it's some kind of computer vision project uh, along the lines of Project Maven, uh, whether it's you know sort of more of your reinforcement learning, uh, you know AlphaGo type type projects. There's certain things that that need to be done across all of those projects. So providing that common framework, um, whether it's and, and I, you know, again, go back to kind of this this R&D, uh, you know, test evaluation uh, type type framework. Um, but there's other things as well. You know, we've seen a critical reliance upon cloud computing. And I think that that kind of gets overlooked when we talk about AI. AI becomes this sort of whole, you know, encompassing uh, technology. But there's a lot of dependent technologies that go that go with it. Um, the second sort of dependent technology that I would say is is networking, right, and the ability to to move data across uh, the continent fast. Um, you know, our our network systems were built in an age when the biggest things we were transporting over the network were email and PowerPoint uh, presentations. I I trust you guys use PowerPoint. Um, so, you know, this needs to be modernized, updated in a in a massive way, right? You know, ripped out whole cloth, new creation. Um, so there are certain, and that's something that, that we really need to standardize across the alliance, right, across the entire NATO sphere. So doing those, those activities is, is critical, right? This is your standardization um, process. The other thing is on ramps, right? We've talked about this before, um, and this is exactly the, the point that you were making earlier, right? We need these ability for, you know, or, for new companies that are creative, innovative to come in, demonstrate their technology in, a, in an exercise, right, in a non-combat situation, um, in some kind of safe and controlled environment where it can actually be evaluated. Um, and, then, and then the real trick then is bringing that technology that has been demonstrated um, to be potentially successful and moving it across this chasm, right? That, that um, the chasm that, um, you know, where, where new technology goes to die, right? So very often you have technology that has been demonstrated to be performant, right? And then when it gets to the acquisition directorates, it, it is not acquired for whatever reason. And there's, you know, within the U.S., there's a variety of reasons that that happens, right? You've got these large incumbents um, within the defense sector that, that, that force out new players. Um, but there's other reasons, you know, congressional, uh, on our side, congressional, uh, you know, funding is, is a critical element. But one of the big problems that we've seen is this lack of knowledge within the government sphere, right? So going back to how can NATO help um, uh, educate the, the workforce uh, within the various member nations, right? How can we educate people on what AI is? Um, one of the things that we've seen a lot of government organizations want to do is go out and, you know, build out their own data science capability, um, which I think is, is, is a fine goal. But what I think the government is most well suited to do is to build out this level of program management, um, sort of mid-tier bu bureaucratic level, right? Where you've got people that understand AI to the extent required, um, but then also are able to, and, and as a result, are able to speak, you know, effectively when talking about procurement decisions. 
Um, so there's a lot of a uh, lot of tail, you know, a lot of, of other things that have to go along with with you know building out this this AI or this ability to bring AI companies on in a rapid fashion, right? You have to have people that know uh, what the capabilities and the limitations of AI are. Um, you have to have an on ramp for them to actually be procured in a in a non sort of test and evaluation kind of way. Um, and so there's a lot of things that, that NATO could do to, to help with that process, right? Once you've got one demonstration that works well with one member country, proliferate that across uh, the various uh, member countries. So broad agreement with the, the points made. Um, of course, unfortunately, the devil is in the details in that, you know, implementing this, is, especially with, uh, as the point was made earlier, with member nations that are in charge of their own security um, and are only, you know, we provide uh, uh, standardizations that are recommended uh, is, is, is challenging. Um, but at least building a cadre of, of uh, educated, uh, an educated workforce that understands AI and the limitations and the benefits of it uh, goes a long way. Thanks, Mike. Uh, David, uh, you probably have something to, to contribute to uh, what you heard and, and just adding to that, sorry, uh, uh, MEP Kylie mentioned centers of excellence and I was wondering if you maybe had a, a view on, on what kind of role should there be for the, um, the CCD um, COE, uh, the Corporate Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Uh, you know, should there be an additional transatlantic center of excellence to work on all these issues that Mike and, um, and um, Annette raised, you know, coalition uh, of some kind, uh, please. Yeah, thank you very much, and, and there's so much to respond to, so let me just broadly say that I actually agree with all that has been said, uh, and I'm pretty scared with the workload that's being put on my shoulders from today uh, in making it all happen. Uh, I think that uh, the points that, that Mike made last year is what do we focus on as an organization is a very important one. Uh, I, I do think we have a, a number of uh, really strong points, the standardization being one of them, uh, the testing environment, the interoperability, uh, the getting all allies up to the same standards and the same level of digitization. Uh, so these are all strong points that NATO has had for a long time. Uh, and then there are some processes in NATO that need to change in order for this to be successful in its implementation. Uh, and there we come up to the innovation part, uh, the inclusion of SMEs, uh, the uh, quick procurement cycles, the uh, venturing into small scale projects and then rolling them out on a larger scale. Uh, I think that this is something new for NATO, but something that is required by AI. Uh, so part of our strategy that we will launch on AI will definitely include how we approach as a large organization uh, these items. Underlying all this, I think, is, is uh, what, what speaks to, to Ava's mind as well. How do we view AI? What are the limits of AI? Uh, what do we want AI to be used in? Uh, and where do we want AI not to be used in? Uh, what kind of algorithms do we tolerate? Do we tolerate the black boxes or do we want to know as a government uh, what happens inside? Um, how do we deal with our data? How do we create a trust that our data is actually stored securely, uh, used only for the right uh, purposes? Uh, so, in my opinion, uh, uh, we need to bring the knowledge of the governments uh, up to speed on AI, uh, give them the trust that we will proceed in the right direction with AI, namely within the principles that they all adhere to, uh, uh, thereby aligning ourselves as close to the EU as we can, uh, because we are one community of values across the Atlantic, uh, and then look for enough new ways of reaching out to the private sector uh, and, and, and to engage actually uh, in, in innovation ourselves. Uh, uh, but that comes together with, with uh, the allocation of resources. So the, the contractual element, uh, or at least the investment element, uh, is, is clearly noted. And I think that the, the power of 30 nations uh, within an alliance is, is definitely a powerful tool uh, to attract uh, uh, talent uh, in, in the field of AI. O on the center of excellence, uh, uh, yes. Uh, as mentioned by a few speakers, uh, we have to build up knowledge. Uh, this knowledge is not only uh, scarce within the MODs or the Ministries of Foreign Affairs of uh, nations, uh, but also in the wider government. Uh, so also there, I think we need to convene uh, bright minds uh, uh, and people uh, uh, into a sort of innovation hub. Uh, and whether or not this is going to be a center of excellence or not, uh, I, I don't know yet. We will have to look how we uh, end up in the proposals, but that we become a knowledge hub, hub 
uh, in its way, uh, if possible, in very close cooperation with the EU, uh, in my opinion, is a must in order to bring this, uh, this project further. Thanks very much, David. Uh, Eva, kindly, before I let you go, I know you have only three minutes. Uh, please, would you like to, to come in uh, based on what you've heard and let you free to choose how you'd want to conclude your remarks? Well, um, I think from, from what I heard, um, what we have to first agree on is uh, the, the red lines and uh, what we want to collaborate uh, in achieving with AI. Um, then we have definitely talked about how we can have safe AI and under control for agent EU um, collaboration. Um, and uh, I think we definitely have to have a, maybe even a separate event to understand the geopolitics of AI, how the global tech war is taking place and what are the emerging powers and threats. I think this, this would be uh, really important. Then in terms of like really um, developing um, uh, the capabilities that NATO should, uh, should have the expertise to have risk alerts when AI it, it can become a threat, um, to set up new security criteria for software and hardware and how it's deployed. Um, this could be a, a, a real uh, uh, role, a very important role for NATO. Um, to avoid that the manipulation, to, uh, to avoid attacks in critical infrastructures. Uh, we are already setting up a cyber unit um, uh, for the digital society. Uh, before the end of this year, we are expecting to have the, the legislation. We already have a European cyber diplomacy toolbox to prevent, discourage, uh, deter and respond to malicious cyber activities. Uh, against the integrity and security of EU. I think this is another field where we can collaborate. And um, of course, interoperability in these uh, uh, AI systems that we develop would be very important to be able, as I said, to not duplicate and overlap, but like to, to collaborate and move faster uh, together. And uh, um, I agree um, with David for attracting talent. It's really important. And uh, we have to, to achieve to do that. We have to make sure that when we invest in the research and education, we have to, to also be able to keep the, the best uh, talents in, um, in our countries and to not export the knowledge to, to countries that could actually in the end pose a threat um, with the technological understanding that they will uh, gain. Um, and finally, uh, it's, a, it's a huge discussion, but when, you, when we are talking about precision, precision uh, weapons and autonomous lethal weapon systems, and we already have countries beyond NATO and EU that they are developing face recognition um, much faster than we do because we also have um, the, um, uh, the principle of protecting privacy and they don't, we definitely have to find ways to, uh, to strengthen our defense into, um, uh, for them to achieve their, their targets. So I would say uh, we should, uh, uh, of course, find uh, ways to, um, to deploy our, our partnership in all stages also of data collection using uh, sharing to detect, protect, prepare, and produce military uh, capability developments. So I think that's a bit um, um, the whole picture there. And uh, then we have to focus and start having like uh, working groups and like have our centers of, uh, of AI uh, joining forces to, to achieve that uh, together without wasting time. Because in, indeed, it's, I would say it's a global technological war and um, this is and this could be a new role for NATO EU um, transatlantic cooperation. Thank you so much, MEP KD, for bringing uh, to the spotlight so many interesting different angles to the to the topic today. And uh, we're sorry to see you go, but we'll see you soon again. Um, and I'm continuing with uh, the other uh, distinguished speakers here, and we have a question from one of our participants today who will come in with a video call. Uh, his name is uh, Henry Roigas, and I believe he's Chief Strategy Officer at Sentinel. Uh, but please, uh, Henry, introduce yourself and feel free to let us know who your question should go to. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you very much. So I'm Henry Regas. I'm from a company called Sentinel. 
uh, that's uh, addressing AI-enabled threats, and more specifically, we deal with uh, detecting uh, of deep fakes, which is synthetically generated media, which makes it hard to to uh, to understand fact from fiction, essentially. And then uh, adversaries could use it in, in very many ways, uh, be it influencing military operations, but also reducing societies. So I was wondering uh, whether any of the uh, panelists have um, some comments on, on how uh, organizations such as NATO should address this uh, general information warfare threat and then what could be the next steps uh, within the general AI strategy uh, going forward uh, in addressing uh, deepfakes and AI generated synthetic media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was thinking either of, of you, apparently. Uh, who would like to take your first pass? Shall I start, maybe? And, uh, David, yeah. I think that we did, we, we did focus in the discussion up to now mainly on uh, the use of AI and how to get uh, NATO and the member states up to speed. Um, because I do think it's essential to be a player in the game of AI uh, in order to also be a player in defending against AI. Uh, and I think that is what, what the, 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 the question uh, uh, that was asked is, is, is all about. How do we uh, protect ourselves from uh, uh, AI used by adversaries uh, in, for example, the information warfare? Um, this is part, I think, of the uh, building the resilience. Uh, and building resilience is a very broad term that we use within NATO, uh, which means that we have to prepare our societies uh, against possible attacks, uh, whether it be physical attacks on, 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 on uh, airports, uh, train stations, uh, cyber attacks on uh, uh, critical infrastructure or vital infrastructure. I think a new strand in this work uh, is also the information warfare uh, and how do we protect the population or how do we create a trust with the population uh, in order to be able to tell them what to trust and what not to trust. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the deep fake uh, development in, in AI uh, is certainly posing us with a, a, a big challenge here, which we will pick up. Thank you. Anyone else wanted to react to Henry's question? No? I'll take a stab at it. Mike? If that's okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So from a technical perspective, I suppose, you know, all the things that were previously said are, are absolutely correct, right? The ability to uh, quickly identify and then respond to um, media that has been known to be altered, right? Deep fakes being just one of, you know, several ways that that can happen is going to be critical. So developing the actual technological aspect of identifying this and getting that word out um, is also something that that should be readily thought readily thought of, um, but this is again as was alluded to earlier. This is not just a problem with deep fakes, right? This is a problem with all sort of misinformation, um, even a problem that expands past AI, right? Um, so creating that resilient population. I just wanted to to you know emphasize that I I love that uh, that sentiment, right? Creating a resilient population that is able to understand um, that there is media out there that has been manipulated and can sort of act appropriately. Um, is not a you know not a problem that anyone has solved yet. Um, so uh, I think that you know from a technological aspect, uh, being able to identify it quickly and getting that word out is is going to be critical. So the work that companies like like this company is doing is is absolutely um, important. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Henry, for your question. Unless Annette, did you want to come in on this one? Um, um, no more comments on my side here, but I fully agree with the uh, last two speakers. So I, I think this is a very essential aspect to issue as well here. But, uh, you. but the other is you already gave me... Yes, can you, can you hear me right now? Yeah, yeah, yes, go on. Okay, so what, what I wanted to say from, uh, from uh, uh, my point of view as well here is that we also need to address some of the, uh, why this is again very important to uh, very closely cooperate with, with the private sector sense of view here is that what we see in many, many cases is the biggest struggle that many, many companies who um, are providing some kind of AI solutions is that it is so, so difficult to train these uh, um, these kind of different models and, and the robots and products uh, because um, the information that these companies are dealing with are 
pretty much very classified. And, and that's why uh, we need to start with this very close cooperation both with NATO and the European Union member states as well. And then, of course, also internally with, uh, with the local ministries and so on as well, so that uh, there will be some of the agreements how to uh, share the data um, because this is a very, very high risk and, uh, and of course, also very classified information there. Yeah, and actually, maybe you can elaborate on, you know, how NATO can help in um, in making sure private companies can can adopt their, you know, their AI security compliance programs because indeed security is is super important for data. And also another question I wanted to get back to you when I asked David what he he thought. So maybe the center of excellence that would be, uh, um, you know, uh, something transatlantic created or, or a particular role for uh, for the CCD uh, COE. Um, maybe you have some thoughts on that as well. Um, so, so I'm happily saying that uh, CCD COE Center is based in Estonia, in Tallinn. So we're happy to, uh, to have this uh, very important center uh, basically staying here, the headquarter. Um, but um, but I, I, I see also that um, the CCD COE Center could easily take also the leading role in supporting the NATO uh, nations in developing the AI-based defense solutions. And, and of course, also, uh, we have the right competence for that uh, to take AI-related tasks as well here and I don't see any point of building any other um, different department again from some side of the world. Um, we have been very advanced in this sector and why not to take the leading role and help also the other nation states in order to um, develop these solutions. But I also fully agreed with other speakers saying that we need to start preparing the countries to understand about AI first of all and to provide general awareness and, uh, and the knowledge uh, how we should take uh, AI, uh, of course, also on the legal levels because there is also a lot of um, ethical problems that still uh, face us all here. So, so these issues have to be also uh, dealt with as fast as possible. Thank you very much, Annette, once again. Um, MEP Kylie mentioned earlier that um, I have a bit of an echo. I'm not sure if someone is, uh, could you please mute yourself? Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, MEP Kylie uh, mentioned um, uh, the, the question of values and principles. You know, some uh, state actors like Turkey, China, Russia, uh, and that we're, you know, in this multipolar system with, with you know, all these rising powers around. Uh, and I was wondering if um, perhaps David, you'd have a take on um, how does that play in, you know, to, to NATO's role and and whether we should maybe involve foreign policy instruments and public diplomacy activities as well in the ways in which NATO works on AI, if that makes sense. Maybe you have some, some thoughts on this. Yeah, definitely have some thoughts on this. And I think that most of our governments uh, coming from open democratic societies will want to put limits on where we let uh, AI take decisions uh, and where the human needs to step in. Uh, so already the autonomous uh, lethal weapons have been mentioned. Uh, I could envisage that in setting out the principles of use for, the, for, for NATO on AI, um, that that would be uh, an avenue that we would cut short. Uh, also, I believe that we will want to know uh, what the algorithms exactly uh, uh, entail and, and how do we deal with uh, the biases that are automatically built into these algorithms. So it needs to be a more open process. So I can imagine those are only two elements, but there will be many more elements uh, that will be fed, uh, that will be fed into uh, what we would consider our uh, Western standards on the use of AI. And if we do that quickly and in a common way across the Atlantic, then I believe that all allies uh, still have the opportunity in the international bodies within the UN, uh, in, 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 in different fora, uh, to uh, tell the same story and to sing from the same hymn sheet uh, when it comes down to setting the international standards on the use of AI. In any case, there will be adversaries that will not adhere to these standards, uh, but that will never be a reason to lower our own standards. Uh, and in that respect, I, I could also point to the use of uh, landmines or, 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 or cluster munition. Uh, we've been banning weapons uh, from our own moral uh, 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 perceptions for a long time. 
uh, and that's never been hampered by uh, the fact that adversaries might use these weapons. We will just have to find other ways um, to reach the same military effects uh, without crossing our own uh, moral boundaries, and this is certainly true for AI. Thanks very much. Uh, and I think this is maybe where I'd like to collect some more thoughts on, you know, this, this narrative around um, the strategic autonomy that the EU very much wants to achieve. Uh, and I've read that this, this um, EU first defense review painted a, a gloomy picture for the bloc's ability to achieve strategic autonomy. Um, you know, experts are saying the EU is not doing enough uh, to address some of the, the shortfalls that stood out. So how could NATO help the EU achieve this, this goal for this strategic autonomy? Uh, it, because it includes a significant technological uh, dimension, right? So is there any, uh, would you like to add anything to that? Perhaps David and then Annette. Well, from a NATO perspective, I would say that, that uh, the EU is stepping up to the plate and increasing its efforts uh, when it comes down to, to the, the defense uh, investments, uh, I think, is a good thing. Uh, at the same time, uh, it does not have to be a replacement for NATO. Uh, and I don't think that many member states would view the idea of strategic autonomy as a replacement of NATO. So NATO, uh, for uh, most EU member states, will remain the cornerstone of their defense. Uh, but within NATO, they will step up their efforts. Uh, thereby, of course, avoiding duplication where not necessary, uh, I think, is paramount. And when it comes down to these big issues like uh, AI and innovation, uh, I think we actually need each other across the Atlantic. Uh, and that neither, uh, nor the US, uh, nor the EU uh, uh, should strive for autonomy, but we should strive for collaboration in order to together maintain the Western standards when it comes down to new technology and a new technological edge. Thank you. And then did you want to come in and perhaps also uh, to react on the biases and explainability because you've raised the ethical issue a bit. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so uh, just just one comment on that as well um, to, to add uh, regarding the European Union side is that we are actually very satisfied and welcoming um, the European Defence Fund, who very much contributes also into innovation and development uh, system. But of course, it shouldn't be overlapping with uh, with NATO. And I, I guess again, that would uh, bring like a huge opportunity for NATO and, and the European Union to work together because um, our fundamental values regarding NATO and European Union member states are uh, pretty much uh, the same. So um, that shows a, an excellent opportunity to work fully together in, in many, many aspects and especially including uh, deploying AI solutions uh, in our market. Thanks very much. Uh, Mike, just to let you quickly react, we have five minutes left and, and a question from the audience, but maybe you'd like to, to react to what you just heard, maybe from the US perspective. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, speaking for myself, right, the, the US, of course, sees NATO as the cornerstone of European security. But uh, I think let's go back to the, uh, the, the biases issue. Um, I think this is something that the fundamental technology of AI still has to, 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 to conquer, right? This is not something that we're going to be able to develop policy to conquer, right? This is not something that we're going to be able to develop policy to, to fix in any short order, right? The, the, the nature of AI is that in many cases, the detections are, as um, Dr. Lin mentioned, right, statistical and therefore, uh, you know, subject to some amount of uncertainty, right? Um, so I think that, that, one of the things that NATO should be investing in, um, along with American research organizations, is how do we get to um, a more explainable, I don't think you're ever going to get to an ex a completely explainable AI, but how do we get to a more explainable uh, AI in this sort of narrow AI um, uh, field? So that's something to, to think about. Thanks, Mike. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, I will present it to you and again, whoever wants to jump in. It's an interesting question related to, you know, the global AI race and uh, it's about China. So what are the risks to the Western world if China becomes the best developed AI power, which is very much on their menu? Uh, who would like to take this one? Yeah, I'm happy to have a first response. Go on. Uh, the, Thank you. Just on, on a first response, I, I believe that we need to step up uh, as NATO when it comes down to AI, specifically for the reason uh, that we want our standards 
to be the, the worldwide standard supplied to AI. Uh, in order to do that, we need to maintain the technological edge. Uh, in order to uh, use that, we need to broaden the knowledge horizon and to team up uh, as nations. Um, the, the flip side of that is we, we, we can't stop China from using AI in the form it wants to use it. What we can do is protect our own data uh, and maintain our own standards and uh, project these standards uh, in the world as an alternative uh, which from a democratic point of view and a, and a, and a, and a human rights point of view is, is probably the preferred model. Um, so in, in that respect, I see us as a, uh, a role model uh, rather than trying to stop China in uh, uh, trying to achieve its, uh, its aims. Thanks very much. Who else would like to... I also wanted to say that I fully agree with David here that um, it might seem like a very big competition and we can't really uh, stop China in, in, in developing these solutions. They are doing pretty good there. But uh, it's just when we make comparison with our fundamental values and then democratic um, state that we are also representing here. So uh, we are taking a little bit different approach and, and that's why also uh, we need to step it up and and, and, uh, and fast this process also in developing these solutions. And, and if we do this fully together and of course also share our lessons learned in emissions and using these technologies then I believe that this is a wonderful network to work together on, on a better tomorrow. Thanks very much. Uh, before I uh, close the session, Mike did you want to add anything? No, just uh, just agree with that. You know, we're going to, I guess the, the rise of China as an AI power uh, really should um, you know, make us more inclined to action here uh, as opposed to, to less inclined. Um, we will at some point, you know, we are now currently ceding a lot of the uh, um, you know, role that China has to, to them. So I think that like, you know, the, the absolute importance of AI within the NATO framework, within a framework that respects the rule of law uh, is absolutely important. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much for your interesting insights. I think we've gathered a few interesting bits here. Uh, thank you so much. So we've heard uh, defense uh, has to follow through with uh, the adoption and adaptation uh, with AI, similarly to the way many societies do now. Uh, however, NATO and EU are not quite ready to face current challenges, but uh, developing AI strategies in common would be essential. So there's a real potential uh, for collaborations. And uh, maybe a problem that was raised was that uh, there is um, uh, an issue with uh, having the right tools within government defense ministries to use AI as a technology. But there is encouragement from our speakers that NATO needs to align with the EU closely uh, in the field of AI around common values and standards to supersede others. And for that, we need to gain a technological edge and we need to protect data and work towards common standards. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you once more to thank our audience as well for following us today. Uh, a big thank you for um, uh, Globes, uh, to Globsec and NATO for organizing this, this important conference today. I will now let you join uh, the next panel, which is led by uh, Maizirai uh, Sita Rahman, excuse me, founder and CEO of Facultas Media. Uh, and you'll learn and hear about how NATO can cooperate with the private sector, big and small organizations, and why that matters given NATO's objectives, uh, which require the development of public-private partnership. Thank you all once again, and I wish you a great rest of the day. See you soon. Goodbye. In the spring of 2019, NATO Allied Command Transformation in Norfolk, Virginia tasked its innovation branch to solve operational pain points through rapid development of innovative software tools. I think what makes the Innovation Hub really special is it's a space that brings together academia, best practices from industry, students, experts in different areas, and really come up with the best solutions possible that we can provide the Alliance. In October 2019, ACT learned that several NATO-owned system applications were not efficiently synchronizing information, causing action officers in the air domain to manually copy and paste data from disparate systems, opening the potential for user errors. Innovation Hub Solution, the Tasking, Exploitation and Assessment System. 
Texas. With a user-friendly interface and automated capabilities to reduce manual processes, Texas provides NATO's Air Command an advanced tracking tool to efficiently manage data across NATO's isolated systems. Well, we're actually quite excited about what we accomplished with Texas. We're able to open a pathway to more rapidly deliver more projects to our ACO colleagues. Right now, software within these sort of environments can take up to 16 years to develop. And we've been working on it for about eight months and we're set to deliver within this week. It's not just how we build the software, but it's also changing the culture, changing the processes in order to support the Alliance in a much faster, agile way. By using its new agile methodologies, Innovation Hub proved that ACT is prepared to solve real-world challenges in real time. That's super exciting for the Alliance because it shows just give us a certain amount of time and a certain amount of latitude and we can make really great things happen and that gets me excited about the future at NATO. optimistic that even in a short time, in a short year, the momentum has really grown. I think uh, we are all on the same page in saying that climate change matters to our security and that we all need to do our part to mitigate its impact and we all need to do our part to adapt and be prepared for the changes that are coming. So yes, I think based on the conversation you can see that the defense sector, the policy sector, the private sector, we are all thinking about how do we do this now? NATO has been thinking about environmental security for a long time. Already in our 2010 strategic concept, there was a reference to climate and security. But right now, I would say we're really trying to do more and to do more more rapidly. And the areas and the context of NATO 2030, which is the Secretary General-led process to develop new ideas about the future of our alliance, in the context of NATO 2030, climate and security will be one of the priorities. And the idea is to really have on the table concrete proposals so that allies can work together to better prepare for the changing climate, to be more resilient, to be able to conduct their operations and missions in a more sustainable way, to lower our dependencies on fossil fuels, and ultimately to contribute to mitigate the impact of climate change. So there's a lot on the table. NATO exercises its forces on a routine basis, bringing together troops from allied and partner nations. Exercises can take place in a classroom or out in the field, involving thousands of troops. Exercises raise the ability of troops to work together and respond to threats from any direction, on land, at sea, in the air, or in cyberspace. Training side-by-side -side helps NATO identify best practices and areas for improvement. We announce exercises months in advance and invite international observers to attend. NATO is ready to defend its members. Welcome to uh, the second session today. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the private sector, this time big and small, and how these connections can be made in terms of our global security. Um, my name is Maitri Sitharaman. I am the founder of uh, Facultas Media, and for the last two decades, it's been a journey to get policymakers and private businesses to actually have strategic conversations um, to, that actually have teeth and have real impact. I've seen this across four continents as being one of the biggest challenges faced by both governments, multinational organizations and companies. Now, NATO 2030, we know, is all about um, ensuring that the alliance is really ready to 
face challenges that are both present and in the future. Quite a few have been named in the first session, AI being one of them. We've got digital threats. We've got climate change. There are a number of issues that the NATO um, uh, 2030 program addresses. But on this particular panel, we want to look at how we can have strategic conversations that have real impact and actually create innovation that works towards securing our global security. So let's not wait. Let's get in our panelists. Um, let's start with Camille Grand. He is uh, Assistant Secretary General for Defense Investment at NATO, whose background as a leading research specialist on defense has seen him be part of expert groups um, at both NATO, but he also uh, also across the board, I should say, in the French uh, defense industry as well. He specializes in defense policy at, in NATO, of course, nuclear policy and missile defense. Dex Hunter Torek uh, is an advisor on communications and policy to the technology industry at large. If I start listing out the names of companies he has advised, it'll go on for pretty much the entire hour. So I'll introduce him in his latest um, role, which is as the head of communications for Facebook's oversight board. Paula Luca also joins us. He is the Chief Operating Officer at ESET and specializes in uh, electrotechnical engineering. And as the Chief Operating Officer of, uh, of ESET, he spearheaded the company's security solutions, so an expert in all things cybersecurity. And Didier Onjana is Managing Director Bellux at Microsoft. He specializes, of course, in strategy and change management with a definitive focus on business development and growth. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us and thank you to our audience who has also participated. Remember, we will come to you for your questions in this particular dialogue. Uh, join us uh, on video or text us or email us um, as you will your questions on this particular session. So let's kick it off, gentlemen. Um, the first question to see whether we're all even on the same page is um, your thought process. Um, lay out for me what are the three biggest challenges uh, ahead for global security from the perspective of where you're sitting in your respective companies and industries. Shall we start off with you, Didier? Yes, so for us, um, very clearly what we have seen is uh, technology intensity has been uh, growing. Uh, to some extent, what, what uh, we're saying is that every organization, every company is becoming a software company. And so imagine if technology intensity is growing, this means that also uh, all of the threats uh, with regards to that uh, technology are also growing. Uh, and to give you a sense, um, at Microsoft, we're kind of picking up uh, about 50 billion signals um, that we need to analyze and that are all potentially uh, cybersecurity threats. That gives you a little bit of a sense of, of the depth and the volume uh, of what we're seeing. And, and obviously the second thing that we're seeing is um, a kind of a deeper sophistication of uh, the types of uh, attacks and, and, and threats. Um, so those are the types of uh, attacks and, and, and threats. Um, so those are really things that, um, that we're seeing every day and, and for which we're seeing that actually uh, private sector is actually creating a lot of uh, uh, new solutions and new innovation and, and standards um, that, um, that public sector organizations and NATO can, uh, can utilize. Paolo, um, I think you could uh, find some solace in that and find some uh, some common ground with that, wouldn't you say? Uh, absolutely. You know, <clears throat> we've been in the endpoint security business uh, ever since it actually started. You know, the first uh, computer viruses appeared in 1986-87, and that's when the first uh, product was made, antivirus product. Uh, and um, uh, I've been with the company uh, since '93 as a student. Uh, I was developing uh, the solutions, uh, and uh, uh, and I've seen the the whole shift uh, of uh, the paradigm. Like uh, uh, you know, in the 90s, uh, malware was mostly uh, just annoyance, and uh, then uh, the bad guys figured out uh, how to make money on uh, on these things. Uh, so uh, uh, so it became much more sophisticated in 2000s, uh, and and uh, much more complicated to to fight against. Uh, and these days, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, attacks on critical infrastructure. It's uh, uh, it's commonly used in something we call cyber warfare. And, um, uh, you know, the world is getting very complex and very complicated. And uh, uh, and the surface for attack is just growing. And uh, things are changing at uh, 
you know exponential pace uh, which makes things uh, more difficult so so this is uh, this is one of the challenges uh, uh, we're seeing and you know it's becoming uh, more and more challenging i would say and um, uh, and then there is um, uh, an interesting interesting thing which uh, you know we from the private sector uh, don't really uh, do much uh, about uh, it's uh, attribution like uh, uh, you know, finding out uh, who is behind these uh, attacks. Uh, you know, we're protecting our clients, uh, and that's it. So, uh, so we don't really care so much about uh, attribution. But uh, you know, governments uh, they really uh, need to do these things. Uh, they need to be finding out uh, who is behind the attacks. You know, if uh, the bad guys are in your country, you probably want to put them in jail. If they're uh, from some other country, you know, it influences a lot of things. Uh, and uh, an attribution is uh, super difficult uh, in this uh, cyber uh, cyber realm. If I can go to you, Dex, uh, from a broader perspective, from social media to uh, organizations like Google, would you say that this is the biggest threat in your opinion, or are there other things on on these companies' minds in Silicon Valley? Well, it's interesting that nobody's mentioned climate change so far. I think from uh, the perspective of a lot of innovators uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, climate change is by far the biggest existential uh, threat that we face in our future. Uh, and this is very much why you see so much emphasis uh, across the tech industry on uh, emerging technologies and trying to find solutions to that giant problem uh, that the world is sleepwalking towards. And you know, in this year of all years, you know, where we're reminded every day of, of the price of ignoring uh, those giant uh, long-term existential challenges uh, to our collective security. I think a lot of people are thinking uh, climate change is the big next disaster that we are ill-equipped to, to navigate. So I um, very much uh, agree that cyber warfare, uh, threats from emerging technologies uh, and digital technologies, these are very, very important uh, for our future. And I think absolutely in the top three, I'd say probably the other one uh, is the deteriorating relations uh, between the great powers, uh, you know, the kinds of security threats we're seeing, uh, you know, between Russia and China and China and India. And then, of course, uh, the U.S. is uh, changing place in the world. But I do think climate change is one of the big ones uh, coming from the tech sector, which we've got our eyes on. If I can ask you, Camille, I, I, I know NATO 2030 listed pretty much all of these as things that you need to focus on um, <laughs> as the next 10 years rolls out. Um, no one could have predicted the pandemic this year, for example. That was, was that a surprise? Is that our pandemics going to be added to this constantly changing list? Or is there something else that NATO thinks that needs to be focused on in the next 10 years in terms of security threats? Well, I think the, the, the challenge here is that uh, uh, when it comes to the pandemic, you will find traces uh, in various strategic documents produced by allies or NATO uh, of a concern with the uh, uh, global health uh, challenges. So, so I wouldn't say no one predicted it. Obviously, no one predicted when and how it would take place. But uh, we, we uh, certainly were looking at this, probably not with the uh, same uh, scope uh, and, 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 and depth as we've experienced in the last year. Uh, what I would, I would add to what my colleagues have said, it, and we are very much aligned, is to, to really stress um, the dimension of the great power competition, uh, which indeed is something that is of concern because we see a resurgence of this great power competition in an environment where cooperation would be uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, to deal with uh, climate change, to deal with uh, the pandemic, and of course to deal with a uh, 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 whole series of, of global challenges. So in, in this environment, it is creating in a, a, a new uh, paradigm that is quite different from the, let's say, post-Cold War era. And, um, where cooperation was perceived as the natural um, uh, uh, trend. Uh, and now we are in this environment and in an environment where the Western um, uh, technological dominance uh, can no longer be taken for granted. And this is where we have an additional challenge 
uh, to us. Then, of course, um, um, adding to what has been said or restressing the you know, hybrid threats, uh, the, those uh, challenges in the cyberspace are of constant concern uh, seen from NATO, and we have to deal with them. But I think the, the, the key challenge for us in, in this a bit unstable environment is to remain ahead of the curve, to stay relevant, to stay resilient, uh, to be able to act at the speed of relevance and, and remain fit for purpose so that our great alliance can uh, remain what it has been uh, do, uh, doing for the past 70 years, which is to provide security for one billion citizens and be a force for good. How much has that changed, Camille, to, to start that whole conversation off? How much of the way you deal with the private sector has changed? And what have you put in place at this point that you think needs a little bit of work or is doing rather well in the way you communicate with a lot of these companies that are assisting you? Well, we have multiple tools to uh, have an uh, ongoing dialogue with the companies. Um, uh, I co-chair with the Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation or NATO Industry Forum, which has enlarged to move from the defense sector to a, a very large number of tech companies, including SMEs and startups, and, and we are quite proud of that. I, I think we need to, to make that happen across the board. So, for instance, on NATO, um, uh, industry advisory group, uh, uh, which also com uh, combines a lot of the defense companies, uh, have been insisting to, to that group to enlarge as much as possible to, towards the, the non-traditional defense uh, sector and to make sure that they are part of our dialogue uh, with industry. Uh, we see some results, uh, for instance, uh, for, uh, about 50% of our studies in uh, last year were uh, uh, focused on emerging and disruptive technologies, so that is a, a good news. Uh, and we do have this dialogue. However, uh, what I would like to see us push even further is to make sure that as we develop NATO's um, uh, innovation projects and innovative projects, uh, we manage to uh, adjust uh, as much as possible the way we do business. Uh, what I mean by that is to make sure that we have a good dialogue with industry at every uh, stage of a process. From that perspective, we have an interesting um, and uh, I think very much uh, uh, a groundbreaking project on the way, which is what we call Alliance Future Surveillance and Control, which is the capability that will be the successor to the uh, AWACS uh, fleet, uh, which has been a, the, one of the flagship uh, uh, NATO capability. And in that domain, what's extremely interesting is that we've managed uh, together with uh, uh, ACT and the NATO Support and Procurement Agency to have a process that enables a very good dialogue with industry, including non-traditional providers. Uh, and uh, we are now well into our concept stage for that. We're going to spend um, close to 100 million euros in, in studies to make sure that we get the best ideas around before we actually move on to um, a procurement of the capability. And that's going to be a, a big challenge because we have uh, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes a bit old-fashioned ways of doing that. But I think we are uh, we are changing the way we do business. We've adjusted our governance models uh, in order to be more efficient. And I'm uh, very eager to see that work in practice uh, with uh, uh, this uh, brand new project. Didier, if I can ask you, since Microsoft has such a long-standing relationship with uh, working with NATO. Do you see that change happening at NATO? I know everyone wants it to happen. Everyone hopes it's happening. As a, as a supplier, um, do you see it happening? And what would you like to see changed? But first of all, I would say one of the reasons why we are here and we are having this discussion is that a lot of innovation today is coming from the from the private sector, and so that's I think at the, at the core of of, of this discussion. Um, with regards to your to your question. Um, I, I think the challenge that uh, many uh, public sector organizations have, and, and for sure also NATO has, is that they're in a, in a kind of a thinking model, which is a kind of a CapEx uh, framed uh, model. Um, and, and what that takes is a very long period of time between the initial uh, ideation of the type of capabilities you need to build and when those capabilities are actually procured and are uh, operational. Uh, and I think at NATO, I think nowadays it's something like seven to uh, eight years. 
That, of course, um, is, is the challenge and need to change in that kind of technology-intense environment where the pace of innovation, the pace of change is, uh, is, um, is actually accelerating uh, every day. To give you a sense, um, today at, at Microsoft, probably about 70 to 80 percent of our solutions offerings are things that didn't exist seven or eight uh, years ago. So the question is how, as an industry, and, and, I, and I love the idea about uh, the, uh, the AWACS, is how, as an industry, we can kind of more co-create and co-innovate, start from small use cases, go to proof of concepts, and then kind of elaborate um, a strategy um, in, in kind of in an emerging uh, way, but in a, in a way that, uh, that really uh, fits with the pace of innovation of the, uh, of the technology. Um, and there are a couple of, I think, ways to uh, to do that. Um, you know, cloud, uh, cloud first, and cloud adoption is is one way. Uh, adopt standards, um, and and we'll discuss uh, in a moment also how we interact with SMEs. The more you adopt standards, the more uh, you also um, are tapping into companies that are building up to those uh, those standards and can then tap into your uh, your projects. So those are a couple of ideas I think we could uh, we could uh, implement and we could uh, make uh, make those organizations more agile. Uh, let, Paolo, do you agree with that? Do you think that that is what is required going forward? I know you 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 have a number of partnerships that you can talk about. Some of the learnings from there, uh, for example, can, that can be implemented here. Uh, absolutely, I think uh, this is definitely one of uh, one of the ways to go. Uh, then there are many other opportunities uh, for cooperation. You know, we've been uh, cooperating with uh, NATO since recently. Uh, and uh, uh, you know there has been this there there was this uh, locked shields uh, cyber uh, defense uh, exercise uh, in which we participated and uh, I think it was useful for uh, for all uh, sides and uh, uh, and then there are all these uh, you know uh, cyber defense workshops uh, uh, where we share our you know research uh, so so these are certainly areas uh, which are connected to to education. Uh, you know, uh, things are moving very fast in uh, in cybersecurity uh, area. You know, things are developing very, very quickly, and, uh, and you need to be very agile, and uh, you need to be able to learn fast. And uh, we're actually missing uh, uh, cybersecurity experts uh, on the market. You know, uh, when we want to grow our business and our company, uh, we're looking for uh, for people, and we pretty much need to to train them from from scratch. Uh, and uh, uh, we've been working with uh, universities, uh, uh, you know, teaching cybersecurity related subjects uh, at these universities uh, uh, just to could grow NATO more get involved experts. In that? Uh, uh, could could no, NATO in this, get involved uh, in that? Well, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess NATO could. Um, maybe Camille can, can comment on this. Yep. We, I mean, we are quite already quite engaged within, uh, with, uh, with academia. Uh, our um, science and technology organization has a network of 6,000 scientists across the board that benefit from NATO uh, funding and NATO uh, uh, support in various areas of science and technology. What's interesting is that the NATO's chief scientist has been working on making that relevant to capability development, so to our uh, actual efforts, not making it a you know, let's um, uh, fund a, a lab somewhere because they have a good topic, but really make it connected to our, pri our own priorities. And this is something quite new uh, because that, you know, science and technology organization has existed over the years. It has done great things and it has supported a number of labs across the, the Alliance ecosystem. But now we really want to try to make that happen. So to make that triangle between industry uh, NATO uh, as a customer and uh, and and the, the network of the allies and academia work together, you know. And I think this is something that we really uh, put a lot of emphasis on in our innovation efforts that the Deputy Secretary General mentioned earlier today. Dex, that brings up a question of how innovators view this. I mean, not everybody is comfortable with their innovations uh, going into a defense sphere, even if it is for global security. We saw uh, a couple of you know, uh, issues around Facebook, for example, um, and the Atlantic Council being questioned. How comfortable across the board when you talk to people in the industry are they, if they're not in the defense sphere, of dual use, for example? Uh, would they be comfortable doing a tie-up, even if it is just for having a conversation? 
Well, I think you're seeing uh, increasingly uh, employees at a lot of companies and across the ecosystem, people very, very concerned about the ethical applications of technology. And uh, of course, uh, I think we also would very much uh, 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 over exaggerate uh, at our peril the amount of support there exists for collective security and for institutions like NATO. Uh, you know, decades ago, uh, I think lots of people would automatically uh, you know, support NATO and be bought into the mission and uh, think, you know, how can I support that as part of my uh, contributions to society? I think uh, a lot of people increasingly don't know very much about uh, the mission of organizations like NATO uh, and really don't feel connected in any way. And uh, I think it's going to be really, really important to continue investing in building that relationship between the citizens uh, of NATO countries uh, and the organization and uh, really going back to school on some of the basic concepts of why uh, this kind of alliance and this kind of institution is valuable. Uh, the, the long experience uh, you know, of the last few years for the tech industry has been concepts, things like connectivity, which a lot of people in the industry just assume everyone is naturally bought into. Uh, lots of people have absolutely no idea what that means. So I think uh, really uh, we need to continue focusing on fundamentals here and assume that everything has to be uh, uh, reinforced again and again to keep winning support. Well, this is a question, right, Didier? I mean, how in, within Microsoft, because you, you guys have been around for a long time, you are a large player, it's a completely different environment, but when you do um, proof of concepts or are talking to smaller operators, how do you convince them that something that they're working on, it's worth it to actually do a tie-up where the funding might be from an organization or a government or uh, entity that they might not be 100% comfortable with? So maybe a, a first uh, kind of um, an opening comment on this. Um, nobody of us has been elected uh, to office. Uh, and so I think, first of all, you need to have a deep respect for, for the democratic um, uh, process. Uh, and, and, and so we, um, I mean, we as, a, we as a company, as I mentioned, we have not been uh, elected. That being said, um, it is our duty and our responsibility to, to look at, uh, at uh, our technologies, uh, the maturity of our technologies and how those technologies can, uh, can, uh, can be used. Um, uh, so obviously, we uh, since uh, many years we have uh, created, for instance, an ethical board uh, around uh, uh, artificial intelligence. We have published uh, six principles. Uh, we're reviewing those principles when uh, when some of our technologies um, uh, are, are used in in, uh, in in a specific uh, context that that needs to have that uh, that review. Um, because as I mentioned, also a lot is uh, is linked to the maturity of those uh, technologies. In in some cases, we see uh, some of our customers uh, wanting to use some of those technologies for uh, law enforcement processes, for instance, uh, where the technology is kind of not yet um, uh, prime time. Um, so we have our own, uh, let's say, due diligence that we have to do. But again, it... I think we lost it. Yeah, uh, for... Oh, we got him back. Sorry, oh, you froze a little bit. <laughs> Welcome to webinars. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and same thing is actually uh, in the way we have that kind of uh, process and ethical review of, of our technologies. The same thing is applies to uh, how we're looking at it uh, with, uh, with our partners and how we're working with, uh, with our partners on, on this. Um, and, and to some extent, um, working with partners and especially small companies uh, needs to be uh, really intentional. Um, just in Belgium, for instance, Microsoft is working for 4,000 uh, partners. So you need to have a lot of uh, intentionality and also a lot of intensity in working with those uh, with those companies. And, and frankly speaking, as a, as a platform company uh, like, like Microsoft, those partners are actually looking at us for, uh, for guidance because some of those uh, problems that we're discussing are very, um, very complex problems, and and a lot of those uh, small organizations don't always have um, the people, the strategy to uh, to really think those uh, through. And so we're we're actually really helping them. Uh, um, another thing that we're doing more and more is what we call partner to partner. Uh, so making sure that we are connecting partners in our ecosystem so that together they can can frame solutions that are that are fitting the needs, uh, the very complex needs of uh, of organizations like um, like uh, like NATO. So here's the question. Go for it, Camille. I, I know you wanted to make a point. No, I, I, 
I wanted to chip in, in into this conversation because obviously it is. Um, I mean, the, the issue of um, ethics and and how uh, are the how is the tech sector in particular ready or not ready to work with the uh, big defense um, uh, organizations uh, uh, like NATO or um, ministries of defense and things like that. I think is it's it's a very fair question, and and Dex put it in the right term. We need to um, make the the. the Tech companies, the employees in the working in the sector, well aware of what we do and what we are trying to do as, as an organization such as NATO or a, um, uh, as uh, the defense um, uh, establishment in a way. What I would say, nevertheless, is that I think we have to be fully aware that our um, competitors uh, and uh, non-democratic uh, societies don't necessarily uh, pay the same attention that we do. So it is a bit, uh, I'm always a bit uh, puzzled when I hear um, uh, 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 people coming from the tech sector saying it is, um, they don't want to work uh, for um, um, Western governments and, and they are organizations and things like that, when in, in practice, uh, they are, um, um, uh, they, they, I, I would hope that they would be uh, uh, happy and ready to uh, join forces in, in protecting, in a way, um, um, very basic uh, principles such as freedom and democracy. So in, in that environment, of course, the, the point is not in saying that they should align uh, their entire workforce uh, uh, behind the objectives of organizations such as NATO, but simply to say that we need to work together. And from that perspective, um, um, uh, I think we have a somewhat better image than, than we think. Uh, 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 but indeed, as Dex put it, uh, constantly with a, with a constant effort to keep that engagement uh, uh, alive. I would note that from my experience in NATO's engagement with the, the, the tech sector, uh, whether it's the um, NATO Communication or Information Agency uh, Night Tech event, I mean, we have literally thousands of those uh, uh, startups and small and medium companies that are showing up uh, uh, there that see a value in being around, in engaging with us, whether they do it there in the cyber domain, in the AI domain, in robotics and whatever. So from that perspective, I think there is room for improvement, but um, we are in a, in a good dialogue there uh, that needs to be continued as, as we do today, obviously. Dex, I mean, that brings up an interesting point, right? Um, and I'm going to come to you, Paolo, as well, just to follow up on that, is how do you build that trust when you already have the big players um, dealing with their own trust issues with the public and their own employees, as you pointed out? Um, you're having to deal with it with the oversight board uh, at this point and trying to win back hearts and minds. Um, and then there's this question of what is the engagement going to look like? So. What do you, uh, or Dieter, or Paolo, or Camille, what do you guys need to do in terms of a conversation between yourselves to make it a more concrete conversation? And that, what do you, the second step being, what do you do then to ensure that the stakeholders, whoever they may be, are also convinced that this conversation is actually concrete? What would you recommend? What would you recommend? Yeah, well, uh, it's an old cliche that, you know, folks in Silicon Valley are incredibly data driven. Uh, the truth is we are all incredibly data driven. So I think there's a lot of emphasis on results. You know, what can we uh, really show uh, as proof points uh, for that kind of collaboration? Uh, what are the kind of benchmarks and milestones that we're really searching for? Uh, I think people are, are really, really keen to build substantive partnerships. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, uh, certainly I don't think this applies to NATO. But for a lot of other organizations uh, and multilateral institutions, uh, a lot of the partnerships with uh, the tech industry have been very largely driven uh, for PR consumption. They have not been things where genuinely uh, decision makers have tried to bring in uh, innovative and disruptive points of view. And Silicon Valley and the tech industry uh, generally, I think, uh, you know, as others have said, really are increasingly driving a lot of the innovation where, you know, decades ago, uh, it would have mostly been governments and, you know, public sector institutions driving that, that innovation. So I think uh, folks are, are building these tools and inventions that are really going to uh, change the strategic environment. And they're looking for folks to really recognize that there will be new thinking needed and that we need to co-create that new thinking together. Well, you're going to say something. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I want I wanted to comment on the previous topic um, uh, a bit. Uh, you know, uh, thing is um, uh, the the cyber uh, world is uh, is a little a little bit more complicated than the traditional world. And uh, uh, you know, in the traditional world, uh, you have governments, uh, you have uh, defense contractors uh, and other contractors who are making weapons, uh, and they sell them to governments, and then the governments uh, use them. Uh, and, uh, and similar things are happening in the uh, in this in the cyber realm, but uh, uh, but with a more complicated twist. So like uh, uh, you know, uh, even if you're doing uh, defense systems, uh, you actually have to do a lot of uh, research. Uh, and during the research, uh, in order to be effective, uh, you can step on somebody's somebody's toes uh, as as a private company and. Uh, you know, in uh, uh, in today's world, uh, where you know some governments uh, actually expressed uh, uh, their readiness to to respond uh, uh, to cyber attacks using conventional means, uh, uh, it's um, it's getting uh, a bit complicated. It's not just uh, uh, about ethics; uh, uh, it can be about safety, and uh, uh, and we need to discuss these things and um, you know figure them out somehow to to bring some some balance. So that brings up the ultimate question, how, how do you invest? What do you want to invest in and how do you make sure that when there are crossed wires and crossed lines, um, who steps in and who's the arbitrator of those rules and standards, Camille? Well, uh, as NATO, I think we, there, there are two things. NATO is a standard um, um, writing organization. You know, the famous uh, NATO STANAGs, uh, which is the, uh, for, for the past 70 years, have been de de developing standards for the defense sector across the board. I mean, this is typically a domain uh, where we need to work more, much more closely with industry because the notion of uh, we write a, the, the military write a standard on their own and expect uh, industry to follow is probably no longer true uh, as is. So we need to have this constant dialogue around um, innovation, around uh, how do we bring in the best of industry into our line of work. From that perspective, what I like is above. Uh, over and above what is existing in terms of innovation challenges run by the NATO Communication Information Agency, by the Allied Command for Transformation, what we are seeing is also opportunities to invite industry and put industry on board in some of our trials and exercises in the cyber domain, but also uh, for unmanned systems and, and multiple other uh, uh, issues where we can benefit upfront from an industry intake and, and bring to industry an opportunity to uh, test and trial their technology with us uh, uh, very early in the process. In order to do that most efficiently, of course, we need to adjust our own processes. Uh, we have to recognize uh, that the traditional way of, of procurement uh, it needs to be adjusted to, to uh, uh, the, new, the best practice in industry, uh, that we should recognize the right to fail um, when we develop a technology. And, and not be simply having, uh, you know, this lengthy process of drafting requirements and then expecting the industry to deliver a few years after, but having a much more spiral approach to all of this. So this is demanding. Uh, this goes against a lot of habits, both on the industry side and in, in the, on the NATO side. We need to convince the allies because at the end of the day, we are using their money to do things. Uh, so they need to be fully on board with all of this. But I'm, I'm quite confident that we will see more and more of those innovative projects taking shape and therefore be an attractive partner for industry uh, when uh, sometimes I do hear, especially for SMEs and, and, and startups, that it is a, an environment difficult to work with the public sector in general and, and NATO there uh, and NATO as well. There is no exception to that. So that's the core challenge is to uh, remain an attractive um, a customer. Uh, uh, for those who, uh, where the innovation is, is happening and taking place. Gentlemen, you're all in the private sector. How do they make themselves more attractive than they are to those small uh, entrepreneurs who are out there to say, you know what, we're going to tie up with a multilateral organization and this is not going to drain us of every round of funding that we've got. How, how do they do it? Anyone want to take that on? If first? I may... 
if I may start, maybe um, I, I think a couple of important things have been uh, said. And the first one, I think, is is dialogue. I think we're not living in a world where um, institutions are providing um, standards and then those standards are getting adopted. The reality is that we constantly need to bridge uh, technology and, and legislation. And to some extent, it, it reminds me a little bit of what we have done, for instance, in the financial services industry. Um, where a couple of years ago they, they truly didn't understand uh, what the cloud was about, uh, how cyber security was handled in the in the cloud, and that only got resolved um, by by bringing um, people together and by having a dialogue, by uh, the industry explaining some of the new concepts, uh, because the cloud is really a paradigm shift in in many uh, elements, but also by the industry better understanding some of the concerns uh, that are very uh, very genuine. And so the first thing I would say. Is, is a dialogue. The second thing I would say, especially to, uh, with regards to uh, SMEs, is that you know those SMEs are investing where there is market uh, potential. And so the more you create that clarity, uh, the more you focus, for instance, on on specific uh, standards uh, uh, and, and, and open standards that people can uh, follow, the more you create that, that clarity for them to invest in, in the right uh, technologies. And also their uh, cloud can be kind of that foundational uh, platform that people build innovation uh, on. And so probably those are um, maybe not uh, the full menu, but uh, certainly uh, two elements that I would, uh, would really consider focusing on. Paolo, uh, would you agree, and Dex as well? I want to get both your perspectives on that. Uh, no, I, uh, I can't comment much on this topic uh, since, uh, you know, we, uh, we haven't uh, done so many deals with, uh, uh, with uh, the government vertical. Uh, and uh, recently we've been trying to, uh, to approach EU and, uh, you know, join some of the tenders uh, and, you know, just see what happens. Uh, uh, and see how. What how have you been finding difficult, difficult Paolo? I mean, what, did, what as an organization, as a company, what have you found most challenging when you've reached out to um, to multilateral organizations like the EU or to NATO? Where is the stumbling block mm -hmm. for you that Camille, for example, can think about and address with his team? Well, it's uh, it's certainly uh, quite complicated and quite complex. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there are many, many steps you need to take, uh, many prerequisites. Uh, uh, but, you know, ultimately, it's uh, uh, once you learn how to do these things, uh, uh, I guess, you know, it can be quite okay. But uh, we are in the learning process uh, these days. So. Dex? Yeah, I, I want to go back to something Camille mentioned, which was about, you know, giving folks the ability to fail. And I think that's a really important example of actually the very different cultures uh, that come between uh, how NATO and other you know, policy uh, makers work, and then how a lot of private sector innovators work. Absolutely think uh, you know, some of those working practices, uh, you know, also the ability to just iterate uh, you know, very quickly on things and to move with the pace that a lot of you know, small and medium-sized um, you know, organizations are working at. I think that's gonna be really important for, for making sure that the two sides can really have a productive relationship. Uh, often they do work in very different ways, and uh, we have to overcome that to develop new ways of, of co-creating things together. I, I want to go back to also another point that Camille's raised about being surprised about having to sell the concept of uh, uh, you know, joint security, um, where there are non-democratic actors that don't seem to have that problem. I've heard this on NATO platforms before, and it's an understandable question to ask. Um, when you all operate in different markets, um, China, uh, for example, or uh, any of the other markets that we can talk about, um, how do you balance your businesses there versus doing business in the, in the West? And how, how have you seen your approaches with your own teams um, being different in terms of trying to understand the psychological difference between the buy-in that we seem to need in the West. Dieter? Look, I, I would even start by, by pointing to um, uh, discussions within, within the West. Uh, if you look at, uh, um, at it, I, I talked um, uh, a lot already about technology intensity. That's really about three things. It's about adoption of technology, it's about uh, skills and capabilities, and it's about trust. Uh, when I see, for instance, the, the recent decision of the, the European Court of Justice on, on Schrems 2, uh, basically that's about, uh, that's about trust and trust 
for sure in the technology industry, but also trust uh, amongst uh, amongst nations. Um, so the, I think the first point is how do we how do we um, uh, talk also between uh, nations? How do we and, and Camille uh, already alluded uh, um, to it is is how we create that uh, environment of trust in which we can uh, operate as uh, as organizations. How we create uh, a regulatory framework that is uh, that is uh, simple and, and stable and that allows us uh, to uh, to operate. Um, I, w I would see this as a, as really already a starting point within the within the West before even uh, considering um, things in in uh, in what you call non democratic um, uh, countries. Uh, even within the West, I think there is um, a lot of uh, things to be uh, you know to be achieved and to be um, rethought about, which uh, would allow some of the things that we've discussed in the last uh, in the last hour on on innovation co creation uh, to uh, to bear more fruits. Um, before I uh, get back to all of you with, an, uh, with a follow-up, I just wanted to let you know that we're going to have a live question from the audience in about three minutes. So, gear yourself up, gentlemen. I have a feeling it's going to be a tough one. Um, question, again, about investing uh, before we go to that live question. So, how do you have these honest dialogues amongst the companies and organizations like NATO, not just NATO, when we're talking about profits um, that are global and in markets that might not be exactly um, friendly or are, as defined by many people, uh, highly competitive. Let's say China, for example. How do you balance what you do as companies in these markets and then come back and try and do deals in the West as well? Um, how is it viewed, per se, when you start doing these kind of tie-ups? So how do you invest without your strategy being blurred by profits. Dex? Well, it obviously varies uh, from company and, uh, you know, individual to individual. I, I certainly think, uh, you know, there's no point having ethical principles unless you're willing to stand up for them uh, in circumstances that are deeply inconvenient to yourself. So uh, I think, you know, a lot of companies, they do want to uh, serve as many people around the world as possible, and they want to create value. Uh, for folks, you know, living in, under a lot of different political uh, and social systems. But ultimately, there does come a line where you have to say, uh, you know, we're not willing uh, to go along, uh, you know, with regimes uh, that are doing things which are harmful to populations or that really impinge on human rights. Uh, so, you know, uh, perhaps I'm, I'm not the best person to answer this question. For me, it's always been a, a fairly clear-cut line about, uh, you know, which uh, governments you should be working with and uh, which context in which to take your technology. Um, let's get to that question. And it, pa Paula, I know you've had to deal with a whole bunch of issues when it came to uh, finding hackers and hacking groups as well, um, and, and the kind of funding that could have helped you uh, get that get to that much quicker. I want to get to that question, but I want to double check whether our live question is ready uh, to go for you. So let's get let's pull that live question up from our audience. Hello, can you Hi, me? introduce yourself, please. Yes, please. Um, my name is Katarina Shortnerova. I work uh, at the Ministry of Informatization of the Slovak Republic, uh, and I'm a policy officer for Digital Single Market. Uh, and my question kind of picks up on what Mr. Angena mentioned about building the, the environment of trust. Uh, and I would like to extend it to, um, um, to the point of view of a consumer or uh, citizens. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if this uh, um, cooperation between uh, private and public sector, um, if that has any, it, if you see any limits to that cooperation, uh, specifically I mean uh, if that can extend to the development of consumer technology and potentially pressure companies into putting back doors in their products, which then, of course, will uh, make consumers trust less in, in their technology and that may, may stifle the innovation because the demand for technology will uh, decrease. Who wants yeah, I'm to not take sure that the, question the, the question was intended to... Uh... 
uh, if the question was intended to me, I think uh, for us as an organization, it's uh, super important to operate in the, in the current uh, regulatory framework. Uh, and if I look, for instance, at, uh, at GDPR, we were one of the first uh, uh, companies, if not the first company, to uh, apply uh, GDPR on a, on a global level. Uh, so even for a customer, uh, Brazilian customer in Brazil, only operating himself with Brazilian customers, he has the same uh, or she has the same uh, she, she has the same rights. So I think it's. Uh, Again, uh, important to operate within the regulatory environment that we are having, and we have also made public statements that uh, um, that we would uh, fight in front of courts to uh, to make sure that those uh, those uh, consumer rights are 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 duly uh, protected. Um, so that's uh, probably the way I would look at it. Dex, Apollo. Yeah, well, uh, definitely, uh, I think that was a, a great example of a hot button topic where, you know, uh, I think there are, are very divergent points of view between some policymakers and the industry. Uh, encryption backdoors are a bad idea. And, uh, you know, certainly the idea that the good guys uh, should have access, you know, through the backdoor to data, uh, you know, is just a terrible, terrible idea. And it's one where there's often been very different discourse uh, between the two sides. And for a variety of reasons, uh, they've not been able to reach uh, a joint point of view. Uh, so I think you know this is where uh, you know we can absolutely have lots of great uh, sentiment about how we should partner and collaborate together. But you know on issues like this, uh, you know there may be fundamentally different interests at play here, and we've got to find ways uh, you know to respect each other's points of view on this. Uh, but ultimately, we might have to agree to disagree. Well, agree to disagree I... or agree. I, I agree. Uh, I totally agree. You know, of course, uh, uh, we obey the laws. So if there is legislation which is, uh, uh, you know, dictating some behavior on behalf of the vendor, we just need to uh, to oblige. But uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, I also think, uh, you know, introducing backdoors uh, is a terrible idea. And, uh, uh, you know, simply our customers are our customers. And, uh, you know, uh, their interests uh, are important to us, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, vectors in encryption systems are uh, are a very complex and complicated uh, uh, topic. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly, I think even the past uh, showed that uh, uh, introducing vectors uh, uh, is is really not a good idea. Camille, is that is that something that has been taken to heart at NATO? I think if I may broaden the question for a second here, I think there is a, uh, the, the key in our dialogue with the, the allies. And for me, the, the easy thing is that I, I am a, I have 30 bosses, which are the 30 nations of NATO. So, so they are very, uh, um, uh, very, very, uh, you know, they, they are, they are different cultures in place from one country to another. And it's important to keep that in mind because that enables us to really um, uh, apply the best uh, possible standards. What I, I very much believe in is a, a degree of trust vis-à-vis um, -vis the public. Of course, there are national security concerns, and we, uh, uh, as NATO, as any other organization dealing with the, uh, uh, defense and security, are very uh, um, interested in upholding uh, those interests. But on the other hand, we have to have the right uh, level of transparency, the right level of understanding by uh, uh, all allies of what we're doing and how we're doing it in order to guarantee both our security, but also um, to protect our values. And at the end of the day, we also a value-based organizations, a group of like-minded countries that uphold those values. And um, uh, from that perspective, the fact that some of our potential adversaries misuse technology shouldn't be uh, 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 should, shouldn't set the standard. Uh, the last thing I would say is that in that context, what we have to do is really think through how we operate uh, with a number of um, um, uh, of companies and countries. Uh, this is not about blacklists and whitelists and, and, and uh, having the right, uh, uh, having companies that are discouraged from working with other parts of the world or whatever. This is about being able to um, guarantee to our allies that when we procure um, technology, uh, um, including software, we have uh, high confidence that we procure something that is uh, safe and reliable for the alliance and, uh, and will guarantee our security. 
So we have another question that's coming from our audience. Uh, Lindert van Bokhoven, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, uh, says, Camille made an excellent point that NATO, quote, needs to adjust the way of doing business. Rapid and agile delivery of innovations requires agile acquisition as well. Can the panel share best practices with NATO about agile acquisition and to create a more agile culture for both large and small companies? So tips and tricks is essentially the summation of that question. Dieter, why don't we start with you? Because I think that's a great way to try and wrap up what essentially it should be a great takeaway for folks at NATO watching as well. No, I, I think I already mentioned it. I'm, I'm a great believer in co-creation and co-innovation, uh, where instead of, um, um, let's say, mentioning the solution that you need, you're kind of more sharing uh, the problem statement and you're kind of uh, working with the industry and, and curious about how they would address those, uh, those different uh, problems. Um, so co-innovation, co-creation is, is one thing. Uh, the second thing is, is really be focused on, on specific use cases, on, on proof of concepts, uh, minimum viable solutions and, and learn from that. Um, already uh, earlier, some other panelists alluded to the, the right to fail and so the right to uh, already uh, earlier, some other panelists alluded to the, the right to fail and so the right to, uh, to try. Uh, those are things we've seen um, uh, really working and, and I think also Camille uh, alluded to some of the programs where they were looking for industry feedback before really entering in some kind of uh, more formal procurement process. Again, the challenge is how do you combine that kind of co-creation innovation that the industry and, and, and organizations like NATO need and then some specific uh, requirements of, of uh, public uh, procurement that it's its own set of, uh, of rules um, that also needs to protect those uh, those institutions. So it's kind of combining those uh, both. But, but for sure, there are good examples, like I mentioned. Paolo, can I get your point? Since uh, you say you're in a learning environment and are still on a learning curve, what can um, NATO do in terms of learning from you about agile acquisition, creating an agile culture, which you have to be pretty agile considering the kind of people you have to deal with? Uh, indeed, um, and, uh, and I actually appreciate uh, appreciate how complicated this uh, topic is, how how difficult it is to uh, to find the right balance between uh, you know agility and uh, quality at the same time. And uh, uh, you know, I don't really have any handy uh, handy tips and tricks uh, I can share uh, uh, right now, but. Um, uh, uh, but I agree with um, uh, with uh, the idea of uh, of uh, like maybe making something simpler, some processes simpler, and uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep uh, or make sure uh, uh, that they are uh, like resilient enough. Uh, uh, but I don't don't really have any like uh, like uh, quick wins or quick tricks uh, which. Uh, which could be implemented uh, as of tomorrow. There are never any quick wins and quick tricks, are there, Dex? I mean, it's a long process to become agile. Um, what would you say that is a good takeaway at this point for best practices? Well, I think one of the critical things is actually uh, demanding uh, that uh, companies and innovators really are providing products uh, that take advantage of what technology really can offer us and not just uh, satisfying uh, the minimum requirements. Uh, you know, uh, a good example is SpaceX, you know, a company that has absolutely transformed, uh, you know, the aerospace industry, uh, you know, in just the last decade. Uh, and, you know, their focus on reusability, uh, that was something that uh, a lot of policymakers uh, and organizations really didn't care about at all. And now we have recognized the enormous innovations and benefits that have come uh, from that focus uh, on reusability. Uh, and I think a lot of other incumbents in the aerospace uh, sector really were not incentivized at all uh, to go and push the, the boundaries on, on these kinds of innovations. They were content to continue refining, uh, you know, technologies that were decades old and, you know, make tiny uh, baby steps. Uh, and really, at some point, you know, I think uh, organizations like NATO and governments as well, uh, they have a huge opportunity to push the private sector to be more innovative as well. I think the final question uh, goes to you, Camille, at this point. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an apt question because if we're talking about 
agile environments, and it goes back to a point that you made as well about the kind of competitive environment that we have with some of the non-democratic actors. Uh, it is a final question from Mario, who's asking, how do we build a common cybersecurity structure with the companies that we are talking to in the West when you have some countries building infrastructure with I will leave this company unnamed, or should I name it? Yes, Huawei, who is a military-tied company with mandatory hardware backdoors. So Mario's question is quite a simple one. How do we create an agile environment um, and when we're dealing with all of these challenges that you yourself brought up? I would say that there are two things. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to talk amongst uh, the like-minded uh, countries. Um, many of them are NATO allies, but there are also the EU member states and a number of countries um, that are uh, some of our closest partners that face the same challenges when it comes to uh, how can a new technology uh, become a creator of security vulnerability. And then uh, uh, from that basis, uh, we should also play on our strength. Um, um, for instance, the European Union, and it has been referred to when it came to the data protection, uh, as be, a, a, is a great uh, regulatory framework. Uh, NATO has a great experience in setting the best uh, standards for security. So uh, having those dialogues amongst ourselves with other uh, uh, sister organizations is really critical in, in that endeavor. And at the end of the day, I think also learning from each other, from allies, um, that the same applies to procurement methods, but th in that particular case, uh, what is the uh, safest way, how are different allies addressing the same problem? Because we're confronted with the same problem when it comes to uh, some of our um, potential security vulnerabilities there. So from that perspective, I think sharing experience, working together, in a NATO environment, with uh, other organizations that are, have a similar membership, with all close partners uh, in, in the Western world, is the best way to address that. We, uh, we start from the same problem. We don't uh, always st uh, uh, start from the same um, uh, um, uh, solutions. And, but I think if we uh, try to work together, and from that perspective, I was quite reassured that on this specific uh, 5G issue, I mean, the, uh, the state of our thinking at NATO very much converge, uh, converges with what's happening in the EU environment. So from that perspective, we do see how those organizations and those uh, member states and allies can work together in developing the smart solutions and then turn to industry or even turn to industry upfront to see if industry has um, uh, smart uh, solutions to offer to enable us to address this and, and work with industry across the board, with, with, especially with, of course, the companies that are um, 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 sympathetic to our views and understand the nature of the problem and are um, um, possibly located uh, uh, on, on the territories of those um, uh, uh, um, uh, allies and member states. Camille, that is a perfect note to end this uh, conversation on. Um, Thank you to all of you for joining me and joining everyone who has been watching online. Um, in the meantime, I do want to tell everyone to please stick around. Next up is uh, the showcase presentation on artificial intelligence and big data with Dr. Anna Isabel Barros. She is the principal scientist at the Netherlands Organization for Applied Research. Following that, of course, is going to be General John Allen and Ambassador Baiba Braje. Uh, they will have that all critical conversation that we need about uh, preparing for the still emerging technologies. Uh, in the meantime, from my panel here, Dex, Didier, Paolo, and Camille, and myself, thank you very much. We hope you have a lovely day. Thank you. Good morning all, uh, good afternoon and good night. As I've noticed that we have participants from all over the globe, which involves obviously different time zones. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Anna Bars and I indeed I represent uh, the largest applied research institute in the Netherlands. 
Uh, and in this short, very short presentation, I want to address how is it possible to get the most out of uh, collaborative networks and indeed involving the private sector and making it work in practice and to bridge the gap between knowledge and capabilities with the specific um, focus on AI and big data. Can you please, next. Uh, so are you familiar with the NATO a Science and Technology Organization? Unfortunately, I can't see you, so I can't see you nodding or raising your hands. I do realize that before me, Camille Grant really made a very good introduction of STO, but I would like to start briefly by describing the STO community. The STO enables nations to collaborate together uh, to solve the defense uh, science and technology challenges that we all face. STO is actually the largest global collaborative ecosystem in defense area. It has over 6,000 scientists across the globe from government, academia and industry, and I'm one of them. So as I am, you guys can also be involved. I hope to demonstrate during this short presentation the added value of STO collaborative research, but upfront, I just want to warn you that it's the perfect way to make the best use or to make more with less. Next slide, please. So the STO Collaborative Network also supports the NATO political agency, uh, agenda, pardon me. In fact, uh, as NATO Secretary General uh, Jen Stolberg uh, mentioned during his keynote on the uh, 8th of June of this year, when he launched the NATO 2030, uh, he mentioned that uh, as we look to 2030, we need to work even more closely with like-minded countries to defend the global rules and institutions that have kept us safe for decades, to set norms and standards on new technologies and global arms control. Actually working on the norms and standards in cutting edge technology is vital for the future of the Alliance. And this has also been addressed uh, by the Deputy Secretary General at the beginning of this dialogue. And I'll hope to show you a little bit more later on. But as you can see, the current network of STO already involves a lot of academia, a lot of industry, and is really a huge network as the the image on the right of the slide shows. Next slide, please. So STO is also looking and facing the NATO emerging uh, tech technologies um, as set out by the defense ministries last year. These technologies have the potential to change the nature of military uh, operations. Their disruptive potential is even larger in combination. So for instance, just think of AI combined with big data, combined with autonomy or working together or hypersonic materials or, or uh, hypersonics with materials. So there, uh, the fact that the private sector is highly, heavily involved in all these technologies makes it only more obvious for us all that there is a pressing need to work side by side. And the STO collaborative network, it just makes it possible, as I would like to show you next. Next slide, please. So, uh, to ensure one of the examples of how the STO uh, activities address NATO emerging uh, technologies is the efforts that uh, has been led in the past one year and a half that uh, came out with the establishment of a multi-domain uh, specialist team that worked on um, AI and big data for military decision making. What we, this team, which I had the pleasure to be leading, has developed a living science and technology roadmap to bring AI and big data to its full potential within the Alliance. The team actually followed uh, the EU type of approach, European Union approach, which is called the mission-oriented research, research approach, uh, which we found to be extremely useful to create uh, um, a co-creation ecosystem. Uh, this approach involves uh, defining what is the objective, so your challenge, the grand challenge, the grand military challenge, and then working backwards in order to define what kind of research mission one needs to do and what kind of mission projects needs to be accomplished. In this way, it, fa it facilitates in a very easy way the establishment of uh, a good cooperation between military, academia and industry and, and uh, obviously the private sector, and to bridge also the gap between knowledge and capabilities, which has been addressed uh, in the first panel uh, 
discussion today. So to give you a feeling of what it means such an activity, we work, uh, there were about 42 participants from 13 nations involving academia, industry and military and four NATO organizations. And we worked together for about one year and a half. To be very honest, when I look at it, obviously I think that every country is looking at the challenges of, of AI and big data. And what we just gained with this activity as the Netherlands and, and from my point of view, no single nation could have brought all this know-how and capability together by itself. So this is really the extreme add value of such a collaborative uh, environment as we have within STO. Next slide. So this is very much talking but what did we find out with these 42 participants from all these different nations and these different perspectives? Because obviously the perspective from academia is very different from the perspective of our military and is again very different from the perspective of uh, industry. So what we have identified is that we need a sort of Centauro approach, so a combination of hybrid and human. So we believe that there is a need to leverage AI and data science to enable NATO to fight and operate with machine speed and power while maintaining meaningful human control. And in this sense, we definitely are aligned with what you heard today by Dr. Herb Lin from the Stanford Institute. This entire vision has been further developed to address key challenges of the alliance uh, that the alliance is facing and we use the NATO military capabilities. So in this slide, you see on the right, the challenge that has been um, re recognized for command and control and communication, that that is actually Centauro decision-making, that one needs to be ahead, but we always need to maintain the me meaningful, uh, meaningful human control. For uh, information and for more the intelligence, we recognize that in 2030, we need to have actionable intelligence and fighting speed. And fighting speed means that it doesn't always need to be real time, it needs to be what it needs to be at the right moment and at the right uh, pace. Uh, these challenges are obviously come across because we're facing a huge amount of data, a very complex uh, environment, uh, a very complex environment and for instance for the information area um, the cognitive and the technology and the technolo technological challenges of dealing with huge and diverse amounts of data pose incredibly challenges for the military analysts and we think that a Centauro approach can help and support and make uh, the, the alliance much more capable to face uh, future challenges. Next slide. The activity resulted, uh, as usual, within NATO with a report where we described how the procedure has been used. But more importantly, it resulted in something that I'm very proud of, and that is a co-created wiki. So we have a wiki environment where we defined what we have done and what are the current and identified gaps, research gaps, identified challenges that we are all facing a scientific community, but also military and industry, and what kind of activities one should do in order to fill the gap between what the knowledge is and actually the practice. So it also provides an overview of the current SDO activities on this area. Some of the identified gaps have been touched in the previous panels. One of them is the need that we have an appropriated NATO infrastructure that allows for exploring and, and the development of tooling, but also that we need a NATO policy to better enable the, and facilitate data exploitation and sharing within the Alliance and beyond. Both these challenges are actually being taken on uh, in new scientific activities and by NATO policy. Uh, moreover, we have also, and this refers also to Dr. Uh, Lee's presentation, that we also have found extremely important the need to ensure robustness and accountability in machine learning systems. And this is currently being addressed by a team of, five, you know, of 15 scientists from six nations and NATO organizations. I would say that uh, a lot of the identified gaps that have been mentioned up to now and the challenges that we've talked during this uh, conference are, are, have also been identified and some research activities to 
tackle them have been uh, are also being conducted. From my national perspective, this interna international collaboration helped me a lot, not only in my own research programs, but also supported the Dutch Armed Forces and the Dutch vision on the use of AI and big data. I would like to invite you to join this community. If you're interested to help, just feel free to contact me. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the challenges that has been identified also by the NATO Secretary General and that was highlighted in his speech is the need to better understand uh, the, the, the legal and the moral challenges that um, uh, emerging technologies put forward. So again, this is a challenge that we are embracing. There is a team of 14 scientists from six nations and one NATO organization that is work that, that is working in the development of what we call the LM, so the ethical, legal and moral uh, framework to help decision makers to deal better with these uh, emerging technologies and their, and their consequences for the military operations. Next slide. Hopefully, with this short presentation, I was able to show you the added value of uh, the STO collaborative approach and that this might be a way to involve also the private sector in facing the challenges that, that we all have to face. It makes us access the, the alliance and partner unique expertise and perspectives. It's, it's a possibility to pool and share resources, data and expertise to increase NATO interoperability to boost quality. But, and as being Dutch, and Dutch are well known to be very stingy and very careful in the way they use their money, I can assure you that with STO and this collaborative network, we get much more with much less money. Thank you. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, General. Good morning, Mr. Allen. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine, thanks. And I hope you're well. Hope everyone in the audience is well today. We hope so, too. Welcome back to NATO. It's my pleasure to host you today here for the, the very important theme, as we have heard all the panels, on collaboration between NATO and the private sector on the emerging and disruptive technologies. And there is nobody better placed than you to discuss that subject. Your background as a president of Brookings Institution since 2017, your background in NATO as Commander ISAF and the US forces in Afghanistan, and your knowledge and your the work you did as an advisor that all gives you the best perspective to contribute to today's discussion. And uh, on my behalf as AHG Public Diplomacy, of course, it's also a pleasure really to work with the Brookings Institution and with Globsec um, in this respect. So looking at the future, lo looking at the technologies that are in the process of emerging and indeed disruptive. Uh, when we look at hypersonic weapons or big data analytics, or when we think about quantum and nanotech, and your background as a four-star U.S. Marine general, as a commander, as a military commander, what do you think the policy makers should do? Should we take all these technologies, take them on as soon as possible, implement them and use them? Or should we try to first create some type of framework for their use? Well, that's uh, an important question, uh, Madam Assistant Secretary General. It's great to see you. Uh, it's great to be with NATO again. Uh, and of course, GlobeSec. Uh, I had the opportunity both uh, in a partnership with GlobeSec, but also a more uh, specifically with NATO to do some of this work uh, in a really important time, which was, uh, I think, a major breakthrough for NATO in 2016 with respect to its embrace of the future, which uh, I really compliment uh, the Secretary General and the NATO leadership, and of course, all the member countries in that. Uh, let me make a couple of points, which I think are important. Um, these technologies are coming no matter what. 
and we have to find the framework uh, within which these technologies have context and in their relevance to military operations. But I have to make a couple of, of important points. The first is that um, it's not about any one technology. It's, it's about the fact that while technology is changing, it is changing at uh, an extreme rate. The speed with which technologies are changing uh, is, is frankly quite daunting. And however NATO thinks about the embrace of technologies, and I think we may talk about that in a few minutes, we have to have, to have a context and an architecture that not just recognizes that technology is changing, but that it is changing at a very fast rate. That's the first point. Uh, and the second point is that we probably need to uh, uh, remember the Clausewitzian principle that warfare has both a human dimension to it, what's known as the nature of conflict, but also a technological nature to it as well. And while NATO is embracing uh, these emerging technologies, NATO also has to ensure that the human dimension of these of its preparation is being fully addressed as well. Because where we have seen in the past uh, a disconnect between the human capacity to understand and employ certain kinds of technologies and the capability of the technology itself, what invariably will result is strategic surprise. And we've seen this before. Uh, and so I, I would say, first of all, let's make sure that we understand that we have to embrace not just the totality of the change of technology, but the rate of change as well. And the human dimension in understanding how to employ those technologies couldn't be more important than it is now, given the sophistication of those technologies and the effect of artificial intelligence in this potential warfighting environment that we're calling hyperwar. Uh, the important additional point to make here is that the, in the context of these technologies, while these systems are individually concerning, whether it's uh, hypersonic weapon systems or artificially intelligent drone swarms, whatever it might be, while they are individually concerning, we have to always think in the context of the effect of technology in the multi-domain warfighting environment. And two points are important here. Uh, as we embrace these technologies, we have to ensure that our strategy for modernization is accompanied by a strategy for integration as well. <clears throat> because where we have seen in the past through history, when technologies are advancing, those sides which were able to integrate those technologies with legacy systems, while they were integrating technologies in an innovative way, new technologies, that was the side that typically prevailed. And I think, while the greatest threat doesn't come from any one single weapon, it is the enemy's attempt, whoever the enemy might be, to integrate the effects of those weapon systems in a way that decreases our decision-making capabilities while increasing their capabilities, the effects across the multi-domain environment. So we have to think across a comprehensive employment of these weapon systems, both as we embrace them for our modernization purposes, but also how our opponents might employ them across all domains in an integrative and innovative manner to achieve the effect of slowing us down while they increase the speed of their capabilities. And I think there's no one, as I said, there's no one weapon system that worries me. They all worry me in some form or another. It is the integrative capabilities. And I just want to make a, an historical uh, analogy, an historical uh, uh, point. And that is one of the greatest weapons we ever saw in the modern era, apart from strategic nuclear weapons, and the, the uh, emerging capabilities of artificial, artificially intelligent systems uh, wasn't a weapon by itself. It was an integrated effect of multiple advanced technologies for its time. And it was the capabilities of something called Blitzkrieg, where we saw wireless radio, attack aircraft, and highly mobile, rapidly capable armored systems integrated together with emerging technologies 
the synergy of which, the consequence of which, gave the one side the capacity to move and decide more quickly than the other. And here's the important point. <clears throat> that capability was relevant not because of the hardware and the integrative capabilities of technology. It was relevant because that side spent a great deal of time mastering the human dimension of how to command and control in that environment. And Anna just had a talk, had a conversation about AI and decision-making. We've heard about the agility of, of the private sector involved in this. This is all about the human, the human component being in equilibrium with the technological side. If they get out of equilibrium, if they get out of balance, that's when the problem will occur. And so our strategy for embracing these technologies, our strategy for dealing with them on the other side has got to be in an integrative human technological nature of war versus character of war equilibrium. And we have to think in those terms. Yes, I fully agree with you. The, uh, we can write how many times we want on the papers that there has to be a human control element for all the AI related or, or uh, other emerging disruptive tech uh, capabilities. But the fact is that the governments are not alone able to just impose that is very clear. So it's not only interoperability among the allies, the haves and have nots of various capabilities that are related to emerging and disruptive tech, but it's actually about the government, the private sectors, the civil society, and as we heard from the science and the technology organization, the uh, academia and all the others. So the, the command and control and communication with a human control element indeed will be the most decisive factor. But there, the private sector, of course, has to be fully on board. And as you rightly say in your book, there is no other way as you already when designing and when creating these types of, of uh, new tech, the algorithms and the very, the very being of that has to be uh, pre-conceived, pre-planned and integrated. Otherwise, right. uh, exactly. yes, indeed, there is a huge risk of systems just talking to each other and, and deciding on their own. To put it simply, of course, and um, no, and exactly. in this respect, how do you see the work with the private sector, with academia? Is it through these uh, inf informal networks, or can we move ahead with some legal norm setting and standard setting? And can we see that the U.S. could lead this? Would U.S. see the uh, NATO as a natural platform, as as it seems uh, to all of us, for the dialogue and this type of work? Uh, among the allies. We saw Woodrow Wilson leading with his 14 points in a decisive uh, moment of history, which later, you know, uh, very much was reflected in the work of League of Nations and the creation of it. We saw the same with the 14 articles of the Washington Treaty. Do we need mm -hmm. next 14 articles with the US-led initiative for this, this type of work uh, for the future? Sure. Look, I don't know that there's a more important question that could be raised uh, than the one you've just raised. Um, and it's a complex question, so let me try to take it apart and, and with my limited time and looking at the clock, do the best I can. Um, first, the, f the first is good news. Uh, a Biden administration uh, will, in fact, commit the United States unambiguously to the NATO alliance in ways that we've not seen in recent years. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, knowing a number of the individuals who are finding their way into the cabinet, knowing them very well. I know that they're both predisposed towards multilateralism and the transatlantic alliance structure, but they're also predisposed uh, on matters of technology. So that's the second point. And I, I would say that uh, in ways that we have not seen before, as we see these technologies emerging, where much of the research and development, uh, much of, if you will, uh, inadvertently, the policy making, which is, occurred by, is occurring by individuals who are writing code into systems, completely apart from necessarily the requirements generation process of NATO or an individual country, we've got a disconnect here. <clears throat> and I talked in terms of the human uh, component of war and the, the technological component of war, all of these should be in balance to increase our capacity to move at speed. 
Now, again, Anna a moment ago talked about our command and control and decision-making mechanisms being aided by artificial intelligence. That's extremely important. And in a hyperwar environment where we're moving at speeds we've never seen before, it isn't enough for the existing systems to be moving at speed. We have to be tied in in ways we've never seen before with the private sector, which really owns so much of the research and development, that really owns so much of the capabilities development, that uh, we can't afford for there to be what I would call a strategic distance between what the private sector is thinking and doing and what NATO needs to, to operate in order to be effective in a hyperwar environment. And so uh, in our own system, and, and I would say watch very closely the testimony of the nominee to be the Secretary of Defense. Listen very carefully because sooner or later, my view is she, she's gonna get a question about how we can eliminate the distance between the private sector and our operating forces to reduce the amount of time it takes from what we'll call flash to bang, from the idea to the implementation in the battle space. How do we reduce that time? Because if we can't reduce that time, that creates a massive strategic vulnerability. And we've built process that relies on legal processes competitiveness, et cetera. We've built so much process into this that it has in fact created our own strategic vulnerability. So the private sector has to get closer. The Russians and the Chinese don't have that problem. We've got to get closer. The private sector needs to be more, uh, has to be involved earlier in the requirements development process so that as they go through the process of their own RDT and E, research, development, testing, and evaluation, it already embraces the needs that NATO will have. Um, because if we don't, just that alone, that process and that distance we've built into it alone, creates a strategic vulnerability, which in a hyperwar environment, in a major theater hyperwar environment, <clears throat> where we will be taking casualties and inflicting casualties, the distance for repair and replenishment, et cetera, could be so great that that becomes, in essence, a defeat mechanism for the enemy. So look, I, I can't put enough emphasis, I can't overstate how important the role of the private sector is going to be as we go forward in a technologically advanced uh, environment of conflict. And as we move this forward, uh, as Anna and others have said, almost everything will rely in our success on our ability to be faster than our opponent. Not just absolutely faster, but certainly relatively faster at the point of impact. That will come from technology. But our private sector can't deliver that kind of technology if they're not closer and we haven't reduced the distance between our requirements development and our fielding of systems. The system now, the system today, we may well be legally perfect, but we might be operationally irrelevant. And we can't afford for that to happen because the Russians are not so constrained and the Chinese are not so constrained. And they've put dates on the calendar in terms of how they will surpass our technological advantages. For now, we are technologically more advanced than they are, but they enjoy a closeness of their so-called private sector with their military systems that, uh, that we don't enjoy because we are a people of law. We've got to figure out how we can remain a people of law, a people that are ethically uh, biased in the, in the, the uh, contest of war, but can reduce that distance and leverage the capabilities of the private sector for our military forces to be absolutely dominant in the battle space because we have the technologies to defeat any enemy. And when that happens, that also, by the way, contributes dramatically to deterrence. And I think that's an important side point to make. And uh, here you just uh, touched upon the exact issue I, I wanted uh, to raise with you, which is uh, there are, of course, uh, people who speak about these technologies as also uh, with regard to nuclear deterrence, that you have to have it to be able to deter a potential adversary. And, uh, of course, within democratic societies, we talk about ethical AI, and the EU is already uh, preparing to regulate. We work uh, in our nations with, with a variety of uh, stakeholders, so it's multi-stakeholder approach, including private sector, academia, and, and the human rights and other activists. 
of course, uh, there are countries who don't do that. So for them, it's uh, as you rightly said, it's it's pretty simple and straightforward. So what uh, should approach? Uh, what what approach should we take uh, to our potential adversaries? Should we look at these emerging technologies that we just have to have them and be able to use them also for the deterrence effects or not? Well, in the end, we are who we are in NATO, we are who we are in the EU, and we are who we are in the transatlantic relationship because at the very center of who we are, we are a people of values, and we are a people committed to the rule of law. Uh, and I think if we ever compromise that, then we cease to be who we are. Uh, and so the challenge, as you rightly say, the challenge is as we move forward, where our opponents will not be so constrained by ethical issues or issues of values. How do we maintain the ethical human control of these systems? And it goes to the point I made at the very beginning, which is that we have to ensure that we are raising a generation of officers and we are raising a generation of political leaders who understand that as we embrace emerging technologies, and we must embrace these emerging technologies, we have to do so in a manner that is consistent with the values who define us as a people, who what, that defines us as an alliance and ultimately uh, places us in a position to be relevant on our own behalf, but also relevant to the world as a shining light of values as we move forward in the 21st century. Now that's hard. First and foremost, the issue associated with human control in uh, nuclear deterrence is one that I think we've got to spend a lot of time talking about. Um, for those who've never seen it, I would suggest you go into your archives and find the old American movie called Failsafe, which was uh, a future system back in, it was made in the 60s, but it talked about a artificially intelligent system that was inside the nuclear launch capabilities and it went out of control. It's, it's a horrible scenario. And as we talk to our opponents, one of the important dimensions, even though it's, the conversations are difficult because we're so different, but even during the worst moments of the, of, the, of the period of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, we could still talk to them on issues of strategic deterrence and that sort of thing. As we talk to our opponents, we've got to have a common mentality or a common mind on the issue of the role of the human in nuclear deterrence. Uh, we can't afford to have an artificially intelligent launch on warning system because the consequences of that are unimaginable. They're unthinkable. And here is where we've got to have a conversation, not just about thermonuclear deterrence, but how AI can be deterred as a capability within that system in the context of our construction. <clears throat> And then we have, and I, we haven't yet, the United States has not had the conversation we need to have with the EU uh, on our standards with respect to the employment of artificial intelligence in our daily lives, but also more broadly in our warfighting capabilities in NATO. So you're making a very important point. Here's where the technology is ahead of the policy. Here's where the technology is ahead of how we can have a consensus within NATO and the transatlantic relationship on the role of these emerging technologies to be wielded in the most ethical and humane and, in our sense, legal manner as well. It is a hard conversation, but we've got to get after this conversation. We need to have it soon. And, and it needs to define our 21st century NATO warfighting capabilities. We can embrace the technologies, but the human in the loop has got to be something we think through very carefully so that it is consistent with who we are as a people. General, with this, I really would like to thank you. I think you pinpointed the exact issues that we are dealing with in the process of Secretary General's vision for NATO 2030. And we will be very much relying on your contributions in our further conversations. This was just the beginning, uh, the first dialogue that we are holding within the GlobeSec framework. And please stay with us for the next panel that will be on innovation ecosystems and venture capital's role in allied defense and security. Thank you very Pretty much. Very important. Thank you very much. Honored to be with you today and to be with all my friends.
coronavirus is something that had a real impact on our lives, on our security and also defense. We will have a unique opportunity to discuss these issues among other issues here in Bratislava over the next few days. You see it in an educational divide between the very successful, well-educated and people with manual skills whose uh, life was getting worse. All that has been amplified by COVID. We see those stresses playing out around Europe now. Questions facing humanity, climate change, fighting poverty, uh, being an inclusive society, bringing the rule of law to many countries. All those issues will be forgotten as countries and leaders, so-called strongmen, fight with each other to prove who's the strongest. The world may end up um, with perhaps less dialogue and greater mistrust between communities and between regions, with a risk to slip into greater divides, so the digital divide, economic inequalities, or the confrontation of antagonistic models. An overriding trend in the post-COVID-19 world will be related to winning public trust and even to get it all back. Trust in the institutions, trust in the technologies, uh, trust in our capacity as a society. Whether it's dealing with cyber security issues, uh, uh, physical security issues, uh, or other issues touching on alliances, the Forum is a great place to bring together national leaders, civil society leaders, academics, and just very interested people. Central and Eastern Europe will see an immense growth in new technology users over the next decade. Groups such as Globosec must push governments and companies to ensure that this growth comes with benefits for the environment, with new skills and new jobs. Cyberspace has become part and parcel of our daily lives, but with the benefits of connectivity also come the drawbacks. We carry out our lives increasingly in the online world. Many of us have smartphones, smart cars, and smart houses. We may shop online, bank online, and socialize online. Cyberspace affects all of our lives, but it also leaves us vulnerable to attacks. Our militaries and armed forces are no different, and so we need to take steps to defend ourselves in cyberspace. NATO's approach to cyber defense has been driven by geopolitical events, such as the cyber attacks in Estonia in 2007, the use of cyber tools as a potential component of military operations, such as in Georgia in 2008, and the events in Ukraine in 2014. NATO and its allies need to be prepared to deal with these challenges because it is hard to imagine a conflict or crisis that would not include a cyber dimension. So what are we doing? Both NATO as an organization and its allies are taking measures to build defenses and enhance resilience by developing capabilities, building partnerships with other countries, international organizations, industry and academia. Progress has been made, but the challenges are constant and demand continuous effort. We recognize that we all stand to benefit from a norms-based, predictable and secure cyberspace. The impact of a cyber attack on one ally could be as harmful as a conventional attack. NATO is committed to defend all allies in cyberspace, as well as on land, in the air, or at sea. is a very symbolic chapter break between what I call globalization 1.0 and globalization 2.0. And I think what is at stake at this moment is, is not only how we deal with COVID, that's uh, in the forefront of our effort, but we have to once again defend and protect the values. You know, I believe in Belarusian people. I believe in the desire to build new country uh, without dictator. I'm sorry to say that the time when 15 big, big men somewhere in one room or 20 or seven decided everything, he's gone. 
What happens in the post-COVID world, whenever that happens to be, uh, if and when we obtain a virus and that uh, vaccine, I should say, against the virus, and the vaccine is properly distributed, I think we're going to see a damaged China and a damaged America. Globalization 2.0 is about the disruption of global supply chains, the creation of more national supply chains, you know, the disentangling of the U.S. and China, you know, the decoupling of the U.S. and China. And if we can play these trends well, then actually I believe that the power of people will help us to counterbalance these geopolitical big trends. It's absolutely essential to support human exploration for space agencies to pool their resources. Now history is uh, making and you are making this history. Uh, we will get over it, I'm absolutely certain. If we, if we believe in our strength, uh, in our values, Hello, welcome. I'm Patrick Tucker, Technology Editor at Defense One. Welcome to our panel, Innovation Ecosystems and Venture Capital's Role in Allied Defense and Security. Uh, innovation Ecosystems and Venture Capital's Role, it's uh, a key issue for a lot of militaries, particularly allied militaries. NATO must prioritize creativity and capital. Venture capital represents a unique area for gaining insights and harnessing existing capabilities within the private sector as the race to adopt and integrate new technology into societies presses onward. So one of the different uh, topics that we're going to be tackling today, uh, a variety really, how could NATO and allies work to ensure safe financing for startups, uh, also mid-sized businesses, various non-traditional players in the defense space, how can venture capital firms play a role in innovation through assisting in the acquisitions process, how could we envisage greater coordination and cooperation between allied defense innovation accelerator programs and other innovation ecosystem support mechanisms, including financing and investment solutions. We have a wonderful panel of speakers here today to address this. Robert Murray, head of innovation unit at NATO. Nicholson, Nicholas Nelson, excuse me, director of strategic development at ST Engineering in North America. And Dr. Sylvia Ceres, CEO of uh, Nit Tech Rocks and Lorne Tech. She's also a member of NATO's advisory group on emerging and disruptive technologies. So I'd like to start off asking a couple of our panelists to say a little bit about themselves. Uh, starting with you, Sylvia, tell us a little bit about what you do at uh, Nit Tech Rocks and at Lorne Tech and how that applies to uh, defense innovation. Yeah, so uh, I am uh, originally an academic. I have a PhD in um, algorithm optimization from Oxford University, and I spent quite a long time working with implementing large-scale um, search engines. I was uh, working uh, on some research related to Alta Vista in Silicon Valley about 22 years ago, which now seems like a, a lifetime ago. Um, and I'm, I'm living in Norway uh, with um, a Norwegian engineering husband and four kids. And um, I'm trying to work now on the borderline between society and this technological disruption, both in terms of creating growth and uh, investing and making money, but also in trying to, um, to, to, to grow this uh, uh, understanding of how um, the public has to be involved in directing this growth. This disruption is happening, whether we want it or not, and uh, it is uh, uh, crucial that we understand which way it's going and how to create it, uh, to make it positive. So I work a lot in, in kind of pub public uh, uh, projects related to large-scale technological uh, platforms. Okay. Rob, tell us a little bit about what you do as the head of the innovation unit at NATO. Thanks, Patrick. So um, I'm here in Brussels. I work at NATO headquarters on the Secretary General's staff, um, looking after the, the innovation unit here. And it's uh, very much uh, a, a team sport. There's a 
whole uh, plethora of, of actors across the NATO uh, alliance that are really trying to drive forward innovative activities. And I see our role and that are really trying to drive forward innovative activities. And I see our role at uh, NATO really in the headquarters looking at two sort of primary policy areas, primary policy goals. And really one is about trying to foster innovation and trying to create new innovative uh, endeavors and create an environment and a culture where innovation can flourish. Very much about fostering that. And then on the other hand, we want to be thinking about how we protect our innovation and make sure that adversaries and potential adversaries uh, do not take advantage of this. Um, the, the, the wonderful uh, sort of developments and engineering and um, creativity that uh, our Western societies, open political West societies, uh, demonstrate. And so that's really framed in the context of trying to make sure that we maintain our technological edge as an alliance, as we have done for the last 70 odd years or so. Um, but equally right now, it's about making sure we win this technological adoption race. And, you know, I've said this before, and it kind of echoes some of the sentiment of, of the previous panels from this afternoon, in so much as it is not necessarily those nations with the best technology who are going to win that technological race, but rather those with the most agile bureaucracies and organizations. And I think that's something which, which we're looking at very hard as to how we can embrace uh, all of the uh, exciting new technologies uh, and, and um, various, uh, various sort of opportunities that they present. Wonderful. Okay, Nicholas, uh, Director of Strategic Development, ST Engineering, also a fellow at SEPA. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I spent about the last 15 years working on these exact issues that we've been discussing throughout today that, at that nexus of defense, national security, and innovation. And one of the key themes, I guess, of my career, especially the last few years as Director of Strategic Development at ST, but also in previous roles, was really trying to get right technology scouting, innovation, and working with startups, I think there is a large kind of belief that it's incumbent upon startups and these innovative companies really to you know, bend themselves over backwards to work with the government. There's a lot of talk around being innovative uh, and getting more adoption of these technologies and getting the best and brightest in the government or working with government, but there's not a lot done beyond innovation theater to an extent, and that's something that has to change. As Rob just mentioned, it's, again, not going to be whoever comes up with the greatest widget or the next new innovation who will necessarily win is going to be who can refine it and get adopted and deployed the quickest. And that's something that uh, all NATO allies are currently struggling with and that we don't have the luxury of being able to enjoy a large capability gap as we used to do historically to give us time to do so. So right now it's really incumbent upon both the national governments but NATO to help facilitate both engagement, you know, revenue generation, and adoption for these new technologies and companies to get into the ecosystem and stay in the ecosystem. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you. So uh, for folks watching at home, do stick around for a poll that we'll have at the end of uh, this session. Uh, please submit feedback. We, we encourage that. And then we'll have closing remarks by John Barter. But first, I want to touch on something that you just said, Nicholas, because I think it really sets the stage for our entire discussion here. Uh, and that is innovation theater. Uh, as a journalist covering this space, I spent a lot of time in the Pentagon at different places where I listened to uh, top-line military commanders uh, as well as lawmakers uh, discuss with great enthusiasm the need to adopt new models for business uh, to uh, innovate and acquire technology very much at the speed <coughs> that they think they see out of Silicon Valley and, and very much uh, shift towards a model that much more resembles Silicon Valley, which is, uh, you know, I think kind of a stand in for all of the different types of businesses that we're talking about. Startups, uh, companies that are getting uh, different levels of seed funding, also mid-sized businesses, but uh, that IT innovation ground zero. Uh, you see Pentagon leaders, you see uh, folks on Capitol Hill uh, really uniformly saying we need to get better at buying things and making things to much better match and acquire innovation that we're seeing out of those sorts of uh, tech capitals like Silicon Valley and there's, there's of course others around the world. Um, so the question, I'll open it up to everybody. What is the main thing that defense technology leaders 
uh, aren't understanding when they talk about harnessing innovation that comes out of Silicon Valley? What's the main thing that they don't yet understand that they need to understand? And I'll open that up to anybody that wants to take a stab at it. Yeah, um, Patrick, I'm happy to take a quick stab at that. I think there are a few different issues at play here. The biggest right now is let's take a look at, obviously every national ecosystem is different when it comes to defense technology and bringing new tech into government, but let's just use the US example right now. A number of organizations are doing fantastic work, be it uh, Dr. Will Roper's AFWorks initiatives, be it you know, Army Futures Command. They're really kind of carrying the ball forward on this, but they're still, the biggest issue isn't getting those initial awards, those initial study contracts. It's really bridging the valley of death. So how do you transition from getting a, ten, a few tens of thousands or a few hundred thousand dollars, even you know, low seven figures, to actually getting onto a program of record where there is predictability and long tails to it that are going to be attractive both for the startups, but also their investors from the venture capital or private equity side, depending on the nature of the company. And that's something we haven't gotten to from a congressional level or even at a big OSD level. And that's similarly my exposure within the UK ecosystem as well. I've noticed the same thing. Conversely, the other issue is largely also just under, I think at a high level, a lot of folks think they understand how Silicon Valley or any of these commercial ecosystems work but there's not a lot of cross-pollination to that. Um, again, just to reference Air Force Ventures, again, they've started a good um, opportunity to go back and forth and get folks exposed to that. But I think at the working level, there's very limited understanding on how the day-to-day -day workings of Silicon Valley and venture capital go, but also what drives them, what are their investment time horizons, what's gonna be attractive to them, and where are they looking to get out of it. So it's not just a matter of you know, engaging with them. It's actually how do we get them in the ecosystem, but the biggest thing is how do you keep them in the ecosystem and how do you get distill that understanding of those ecosystems and venture capital and startups down to that working level, that, you know, mid-civil servant or your 03, 04 level in there. And that's a challenge that I think we're still struggling with bravely. Sylvia, what do you think of it? Because you have great experience in Silicon Valley and uh, in defense establishments. What is that gap between what defense leaders want in terms of harnessing innovation, supporting non-traditional players, and what those non-traditional players are uh, looking for from defense establishments? I think this is more of a culture gap issue. So um, the way that we measure success in uh, public um, procurements is you know the, the 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 minimization of risk while these um, uh, new technology companies whether they are startups in silicon valley or elsewhere are really uh, experts in monetizing risk they are not minimizing it they are monetizing it and you know they have a completely different sense of urgency they have a different understanding of necessity of risk taking they have um, flexibility in the way that they develop and grow their products uh, rather than the over-specified monolithic huge uh, purchases that are being made typically by governments or by the military. And uh, I think they understand the new business model. In a data-driven world, it's the guys who have the data that will be managing this virtual infrastructure. And so understanding who the new controllers are going to be uh, with greater sense of urgency is something that I think that we need to uh, help our governments and uh, our military leaders uh, learn. Okay, Robert, your your take on this. Yeah, I mean, I don't have too much more to add to, to what uh, Nicholas and Sylvia have, have already said. I think, I think the only other point which is worth noting is this notion of incentives. And so in the private sector, particularly in the areas we're talking about, there is a strong incentive to take risk um, and to take commercial risk uh, and to try things and, and to work at a much quicker tempo in order to see if that risk plays out or not than government. Because fundamentally, governments are, are simply not um, geared and designed to take those sorts of risks. Um, and I'm not talking about specific business ones, but just in very much cultural, organizational terms. So I just think that there is, until we kind of um, find that common language, and it kind of goes back to what Nick was saying with regards uh, to making sure we need to have various people from across both the public sector and actually from the technology sector, kind of perhaps embedding in uh, each other's organizations and learning how they work to try and carve out that middle ground, try and find that middle ground. And um, Air Force Ventures are a good example of that. And uh, the US company Shift is 
is providing opportunity um, for, for similar sorts of uh, embedded placements. Um, we need to be able to talk the language together. And at the moment, um, I don't think we are. I think that there is a, there is a, big, um, a big delta, a big difference between the sort of political ambition um, and the actual sort of perceived being the sort of political ambition um, and the actual sort of perceived risk taking uh, within a lot of organizations in, in government that come uh, with that. And that to me, um, if the incentives aren't there, which are probably not at the moment, then it's going to be very difficult to be able to align um, those, two, those two groups you know, of tech companies and governments. Yeah, I, uh, so one thing that uh, has just emerged that's very important is, is risk-taking and uh, diversions of opinions and perceptions of what risk-taking uh, can do, what it, it should be. Uh, military, of course, is uh, the entire point of it is to correctly identify and, and then to minimize risk as opposed to uh, <laughs> dealing with risk in a very different way. It's either uh, public funds or it's life and death. Uh, startups. Uh, Non-traditional players have a very different view of risk as, as something that uh, uh, is can be embraced uh, as long as it's understood. So uh, you mentioned, Nicholas, the uh, AFWorks program, it's the Air Force Innovation Network, uh, some very interesting stuff out of Will Roper, who's the chief acquisitions uh, um, official at the U.S. Air Force, uh, and some things that he's been doing, going out to different uh, places across the United States, academic uh, settings, uh, some business settings, and uh, often just showing up with a credit card and, and seeing who has an interesting idea and actually buying it on the spot. Uh, but, you know, also worth pointing out that if you look at the at the Pentagon budget every year, and we'll have one out in, uh, probably by February, you'll see that the top ticket items are uh, the same ticket items that they have been for a long time. It's these huge programs of record. They move very slowly. They uh, you know, become the target for a, a lot of public scrutiny, things like modernization of nuclear uh, ICBMs, different fighter jets, that sort of thing. So how can NATO and allies work to ensure safe financing for startups? You, you mentioned the efforts model, but it's small and it's, it's not really characteristic of the larger whole. How can NATO work to ensure safe financing for startups? How can they overcome this culture gap that Sylvia just mentioned? Yeah, so I think there are a couple different things there when you look at it um, from a financing standpoint. It's two things really. How can you ensure that the financing you get is safe? And at the same time, how do you actually get that financing to these startups and deploy it? So you talked about, for instance, Will Roper's uh, programs with pitch days and same day awards, which are a great uh, start to that. And similar programs should definitely be replicated throughout the NATO allies. But at the same time, they should also reflect priorities that are made at the strategic level so that there's not a duplication of effort. But at a time, if two national militaries, for instance, need similar things, NATO has a key role to play in facilitating, perhaps pulling that funding together from multiple different allied companies, uh, sorry, countries, and doing at similar RFPs or awards to these startups to make it more attractive and to incentivize both the startups and their investors to play ball a little more. Now, the second part is really how do you ensure that financing is indeed safe? So one thing, for instance, going in the U.S. is the Trusted Capital Marketplace under Ellen Lord, who is uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Sustainment, and that is helping vet both private equity, family offices, venture capital, in terms of where are they getting their money from and making sure that it's not coming from adversaries or potential um, countries that pose a risk to the United States or its allies. So by having that pre-vetted capital, you are doing a lot of the, um, the work, so to speak, for not just ensuring that you have access to these tools as a country, but that also these startups don't have the bandwidth to perhaps vet three or four levels down and illuminate the you know, venture supply chains of these different funds because you know, they are running a lean model. So that is a great service, serving as a clearinghouse, not just for a few countries, but if you could serve as a clearinghouse across all of the allies and be an aggregator for, hey, these venture capital firms, we know where it's coming from, or these startups or these suppliers, we've looked at their supply chains. And being a centralized clearinghouse from the capital side, that's, I think, one of the best uses of NATO's time to basically replicate both national efforts like TCM, not but it'd be essentially really repository for that, if that makes sense, and really 
ensuring that the startups not only know how to access that information, but also that you're getting to them early. Because the final piece of this is really, you know, China and Russia to a lesser extent are deploying capital at an even greater rate into a lot of emerging and disruptive tech, and they're getting them early in their life cycles. So if you are not identifying these startups and engaging with them early, someone else is going to be, and that's going to pose a real risk to both national militaries and NATO writ large. Mm. Yeah, and so you, you mentioned something uh, that I think is very interesting, and that is the possibility for NATO uh, as an uh, entity to uh, help to, to finance these these different uh, companies, these different startups, help make the business model for them. Uh, I've dealt with NATO for a long time, and it's a great big family. And uh, as a uh, like any family, there's a lot of disagreements, and uh, there's also, I think, a wide uh, menagerie of different technical needs of different military needs. Right. So you've got uh, you know a country like Estonia, extremely tech forward. They're going to have perhaps different IT and acquisition needs than another country. Uh, so uh, to you, Rob, and also Sylvia, um, to what extent can NATO as a whole uh, entity, as, as a singular uh, thing, help to provide the sort of financing that is necessary for these uh, non-traditional players, for these smaller companies, to know that they have a safe market? Yeah, so maybe, maybe I can take go, a Rob? start on Oh, okay, Sylvia, please, go uh, ahead. No, we are being English. Okay, fine. So, um, so I think that there are two or three uh, tactics that we could use. One is to be um, smarter at purchasing. So rather than creating these extremely long uh, horizon, overly technically specified, um, uh, very negotiated uh, uh, re requirement lists, I think that they should come with a problem. And then they should listen uh, through a beauty contest to uh, a competition of uh, the best ideas, because that way they would get much of the forward thinking into the purchasing process. And then they should find a way to, to you know, do, do almost like a venture capitalist would do a due diligence and find the best consortia to deliver. So it's more innovative purchasing. I think that they should also be more uh, um, they should they should divide these processes into smaller time intervals in silicon valley they love to say you know fail fast fail early uh, i think in military context we can't say that but we can say use fast fail safely so they could use the military exercises in a more virtualized setting to exercise and to test all this new um, new, new technology m much, much faster than they're doing today. I think the main problem that I see here is that the private sector is outrunning the governmental sector and we can't afford that. And, um, and the last idea I would like to propose is that they could, uh, actually two more. One is uh, that they should be, have, have a risk fund. So maybe 10% of the investment should be set aside to some sort of skunk works uh, and, and should be managed perhaps more like DARPA used to manage its projects. I'm, I'm very much in love with DARPA. Um, and uh, there the focus could be also on dual use to a larger extent. And the last idea is I think they should think of an innovation platform in a, in a sort of a architecture setting, not a weapon platform, and something that would be useful for all NATO countries where they could plug in their own uh, needs and their own solutions and perhaps that way also protect our national interests. Okay, so just to recap Sorry, real quick, because uh, there are a ton of like great ideas, there, and I want to get to you in a second, Rob, but uh, starting off with uh, reforming the acquisitions process around these hard requirements more towards a problem statement, which is something that military has said it wants to do, continues to struggle with the United States. It's a great idea. Uh, also, a, a, a risk fund. Uh, and more iterative exercises using virtualization so that you can actually test some of these IT solutions uh, more before you uh, begin to make purchasing decisions about them. Uh, it, all of that sounds fantastic and uh, very different from what we have today. Rob, please go ahead. So let me let me try and um, try and pick up on some of the points that we've just heard, but, but kind of frame these around some so those policy objectives I, I, I talked about at the beginning of protecting innovation, but also fostering it. So in the notion of protect, what Nicholas was talking about with trusted capital and so on and so forth, you know, really what we're getting at there is trying to address the, the impact of potential predatory investment activities by competitor states. And so what we're seeing is many nations 
starting to enhance their national financial screening efforts. Um, fundamentally, you know, allies want to scrutinize those investments which occur in areas relating to national security and their domestic firms. So, for example, in 2018, the United States put in place the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, FIRMA, uh, which was legislation providing enhanced powers to the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, um, CFIUS, for such purposes. In October this year, the European Union issued guidance to member states on financial screening for best practices, um, which became operational. In, November, in this month, in fact, uh, earlier this month, the UK created new legislation with regards to its financial screening on national security investments. Uh, and then back in April this year, Canada, Canada published um, uh, their policy statement on this, uh, stating that foreign investments are going to be subject to enhance scrutiny during this, um, this, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. My point being is that many allies are already putting in place uh, legislation with regards to financial screening as to what is being invested in those companies of various sizes uh, that have an impact on national security. So from a protect policy objective of protecting our innovation, what we should be thinking about at NATO is how um, for those nations that perhaps don't have this sort of uh, either legislation or quite frankly, the facilities to do such financial screening, um, we should be seeing if we might want to create uh, a standard or guidance um, based on sort of the best practice that we're seeing from other allies um, and see if uh, others um, that perhaps haven't adopted these approaches uh, are willing to, be able to do so. The other point to note with regards to VC investment in this time of 2020 in COVID uh, times is that we've seen a 71% drop off of investment from US VC firms across all sectors. Now, the prime reason that's happened is because uh, there just hasn't been the ability to do the levels of due diligence that venture capital funds would normally do with regards to uh, closing deals. That doesn't mean that the demand for investment has gone away. It means that the sort of the, 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 the traditional supply is diminished and it exposes startups and other companies to um, it makes them vulnerable uh, to other investors. So there's a whole protect element there that needs to be understood um, and, and taken into account. Trusted Capital Marketplace is a great solution, which the United States uh, is, is pushing hard through uh, Ellen Law's office, as, uh, as was mentioned. Um, and we need to see if that could be perhaps looked slightly wider and, 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 and looked at an alliance level, um, whilst, of course, minimizing transaction costs. We want to make sure that any sort of effort like that isn't bureaucratic and um, doesn't actually distort markets. So that's kind of the protect side. Very long answer, apologies. Slightly quicker answer on uh, the sort of how we might want to foster innovation, how we might want to actually engage in these companies. Um, again, allies are kind of already doing this. So we're seeing venture capital funds like Inkytel, they've been around for 20 odd years, okay, they've been, they've from, from the United States, Air Force Ventures, um, Def Invest in France, Smart Cap in Estonia, the National Security, uh, National Strategic, National Security Strategic Investment Fund in the UK. Uh, I see Lithuania has just launched a government VC fund. So we're seeing a lot of governments within the alliance launching these sorts of venture capital funds to actually try and get at addressing that that foster issue of trying to generate innovation. Um, for these very reasons. And of course, when governments create those funds within the alliance, by default, it makes that money trusted and it will allow extra crowding in into that trusted capital marketplace. So I think you know, we, we should, from NATO, to how we might want to help that foster effort is perhaps signpost um, and indicate where we believe that from an alliance perspective, such investment would be of utility to the alliance writ large. And we might want to be thinking a little bit more in terms of patient capital, so investing earlier on in what we might call deep tech, really difficult problems, um, where perhaps you can't measure the risk, and in fact you're venturing into uncertainty. And that's the role where the public sector and governments can add uh, disproportionate value. 70%, what was that figure that you just quoted of the drop-off in VC funds as a result of COVID? It was how much? 71% of investment from VCs across all sectors this year has occurred. That's from a Harvard uh, University working paper. Yeah, I, That's incredible. That's an incredible that. Go ahead, Nick. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, just uh, from, uh, obviously, from my perspective, 
obviously COVID had an outsized impact on venture capital, but we've seen actually, if you look at what's going on already in Q3, we've seen a near whole rebound actually from the venture capital markets down by only low single, single digits year on year. So while there was for a second half of Q1, especially Q2, we've already seen a lot of that, that huge dip that Rob talked about. That's already rebounded to a large extent. So I think there were, as he pointed out rightly, both venture capital and private equity, which uh, we kind of leave out a lot of these discussions, was increasingly playing a role both from a acquisition and minority stake standpoint. That, that investment has rebounded as due dil- people have gotten more comfortable and they've been able to carry out their due diligence or in some unique cases that I've uh, seen recently, actually have been able to just do remotions, which you wouldn't have even conscience six, seven months ago. Well, that's very reassuring. And I, I had not heard that that figure. It, it certainly is uh, an overwhelming figure. And it's good to hear of some rebounding. And I wonder, though, do we think that some of these government-based uh, funding mechanisms that you just mentioned, Rob, are they able to fill the the void that, I guess has been uh, partially returned, but that still exists in terms of VC funding. And do we think that they're actually competitive against Chinese or other investment? Uh, are the, do the numbers match up in terms of how much China is able to uh, feed to that problem, how big the problem is, perhaps as a result of COVID-19 or otherwise, uh, and the amount of money that these government uh, funding mechanisms are willing to put in? Is there a, a good balance there into your mind? Well, from from my perspective, the the government venture capital funds I've mentioned there, they're not designed to be able to try to compete with the private private sector, the private markets there. That's not not what they're designed um, for. Uh, They're they're looking really at earlier stage investments. I mean, let's let's understand, you know, for those of you who know um, Mariana uh, Mazzacuto's book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, you know, she talks about how those sort of seed rounds, uh, the, the, the um, probability of a, of a loss is around sort of uh, 66%. And so that's high risk. And when you go further to the left, that percentage uh, gets higher. So I would argue that a lot of these government funds, um, they have their own thesis. Uh, they have areas which they want to focus on. And it's not really there to compete uh, with the, the private market. I would suggest that um, by their nature, uh, and the fact that when a government fund is able to invest in a company, you know, it builds confidence with uh, um, private investors uh, that there's actually a market there, that there's actually going to be potential contracts and revenue at the end of this process. And therefore, I would suggest that one of the, not the only, but one of the greatest strengths that they present is that ability to sort of crowd in uh, additional private investment, which perhaps otherwise might not occur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and just to tack on to Rob's point there, I think he's very right when it comes to, this is much more of a signaling issue. So for instance, we use the example of Air Force Ventures before or AFWorks. At the end of the day, a $150,000 study contract is not going to suddenly make a startup survive long-term or be anywhere near able to compete with investment coming from China. However, what it does do is create a signaling mechanism with a pathway obviously to future smaller contracts, but at the end of the day, provides a revenue stream and signaling for other venture capital shops or corporate venture capital or indeed private equity where, hey, this is revenue, look, we're getting traction with the government and that makes them a little more confident and also raises valuations for both initial stage investors as well as ones coming in, say, later on. Because when we talk about startups, I do want to be careful here, it's not just the, C, the two-man seed shops or you know it, the Series A, it's we're talking Series B, Series C in some cases, going on that may have been around three or four years and there's some great examples out there but what government can do is both provide more rapid contracting so not just investment but a pathway forward like the cyber process in the u.s and some of that being done in the uk as well but that also that they can use things market things like the trusted capital marketplace to bring in bigger larger investors who have multi-billions under management or aum such and there's a number in the u.s who've kind of gone down that path the general catalyst lux that are already heavily uh, involved in that market. You're seeing the same thing through like Mithril Capital or uh, even Founders Fund to a lesser extent who are more willing to go in when they see revenue opportunities there. Even some of the biggest names like Andreessen have gotten more heavily involved in that uh, when they see that there is a path towards greater revenue and perhaps having an early anchor tenant such as the government. So I think at the end of the day, it's really more about signaling rather than ever being a size play against China. Because at the end of the day, scale-wise, that's not gonna happen. But what our unique advantage in the West is largely is to be able to pull in 
all this private capital? Because at the end of the day, you still look at globally. The United States alone represents over 54% global VC, and with Europe about another 28 and change percent, and that's obviously not counting even some other NATO allies in there. So you're still looking at that. The vast preponderance of global venture capital exists in NATO, the NATO alliance, basically, and its close allies, obviously, within the Five Eyes community or other partnerships. Sylvia, what do you think? Are, is, are those sorts of efforts meeting the need, uh, or what can be done to uh, augment them? I think that um, uh, the statement that these uh, these funds are not really created to make a profit is uh, a very uh, it's creating a moral hazard basically. Um, it reminds me of that old joke that the company you know says that we are a non-profit, not really designed to be that way, but that's just how it turned out to be. So um, I think that it's not their primary role to make money. Their primary role, I agree, should be signaling and it should be setting up a market. But I think that they um, you know if they manage to create some new value on the basis of uh, that market creation and that uh, investment, um, great. That means more money to invest in new startups again. So um, I have an example, uh, for example, in Norway, where um, a fantastic um, nano um, drone company was developed um, with uh, actually some uh, support from the state um, and then it got bought by an American company. And when I was asking, why, why didn't we invest? Why, why didn't we buy that company? It would say, well, that's not our role. That's not how, you know, that's not why we are here. And uh, I think that if we actually um, kept that company uh, within our financial controls, that we could also uh, influence its uh, further strategy and its further development. So um, I also think that these companies can um, mitigate risk and uh, create an entry position through that uh, valley of death, as uh, Nicholas uh, was also mentioning. But I, I really think they should be um, more uh, ambitious in terms of uh, their financial returns. Okay. Uh, quick reminder, everybody uh, watching, there will be a poll coming up. So we want you to stay for the poll and participate in the poll. And right now we're going to go to a live question from the audience. Hello, uh, good evening um, to everyone. Uh, my name is Simona Sade. I'm a senior analyst with EUISS. We are an EU agency based in uh, Paris. Um, thank you to the panelists for a very insightful conversation so far. I'm just uh, wondering two, two things that haven't come up in the conversation so far. The first one is to do with what, what, what expectations do you have the new uh, NATO policy on emerging and disruptive technologies as well as innovation uh, to have on national defense budget, particularly on R&D? Because I think this connects very well to our ability to uh, drive innovation as well as to connect to the private sector. My second question, if I may abuse uh, your time, um, has to do with... Um, the uh, technology transfer um, regime. And um, this has been one area identified by private sector as an op obstacle, particularly the fragmentation of the transatlantic uh, tech uh, transfer regime has been identified as an obstacle. So what can or should the alliance do to, um, to alleviate this? And finally, if I can just piggyback on the previous conversation, uh, uh, I do work for a new agency. I'm just wondering where do you think we should focus EU-NATO cooperation uh, with respect to bringing some coherence to VC national funds as well as to uh, investment screening um, across, the, across the alliance. Um, thank you so much. Who wants to take those? There's three. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe I'll start with the one with regards um, NATO and R&D money and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. I think that um, fundamentally, uh, when nations want to spend money on new technologies, uh, now I suspect that there is going to have to be a significant um, societal benefit as well. Uh, uh, that may sound very obvious, um, but uh, I suspect that there is going to have to be this, this dual use. So first of all, um, if, that, if that is a clear uh, value proposition, if you wish, then I suspect it's going to be a relatively, relatively 
um, easier conversation between ministries of defense and their finance ministries. Um, however, let's not confuse innovation with research and development, right? Research and development is part of innovation, but it is not innovation in itself. And fundamentally, what is needed is a very uh, clear and quite frankly, brave uh, plan as to where a nation wants to get to with its industrial efforts and thus technology. And R&D plays a part of that. And that is part of the whole innovation uh, pipeline, if you like. So it has to be, I think, to get the real benefit and the merit that comes from research and development. And again, we also, we won't do it now, but we need to break out research from development. Uh, too often these things are grouped together. However, they have distinct roles and arguably the types of capital that go to each are different. Um, but there has to be, I think, a bold plan as to where allies wish to go and how that links, how that links to domestic industrial policy, because that is where you get the, um, the, the linkages within the various ecosystems needed for this, um, but also that dual use effort, which brings society along uh, with you. Okay. So, yeah, Nick. Yeah. I'll, I'll add to that. So, um, I yeah. think that um, in terms of uh, domestic policy and R&D budgets, um, I, I uh, basically completely um, uh, stand behind uh, what Robert said. It has to be a, a clear and brave plan. And I think it should be based on some uh, unique national strengths and it should be prioritized. And it also should be concrete and it should have a timeline that starts, you know, in 2021, not in 2027 or, or beyond. Uh, and, um, and then I think that the alliance should use actually its uh, complexity and its size uh, as a strength uh, in order to create this holistic uh, underlying platform. And I believe that the underlying platform should be a data data management platform that has these uh, kind of role-based access rules and an ability to deal with public data in a way that um, I, I don't think that we can see um, in, in any of the privately held um, um, competitive um, market data platforms at the moment. Um, and that should also be used as a platform for interoperability, which is a word that is a lot used, but it's really hard to implement uh, with the complexity of the, of the alliance. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And that's something that uh, we're seeing right now. The United States, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, uh, very recently stood up over the last couple of years, uh, got its sort of feet on the ground with some small-scale projects, and they're moving towards the implementation of what they call the Joint Common Foundation, which is very much what you describe as a platform, Sylvia. It's uh, the place where basically any component of the U.S. military can go if they don't have a data scientist, if they don't have their data structured in a way that's uh, logical and coherent and uniform. Uh, that Joint Common Foundation allows them to begin to experiment with uh, machine learning methodologies and, and clean their data, uh, and it sort of does all of that work for them. So something like that for NATO with data uh, could be a, a huge step forward in interoperability. And that interoperability challenge is one that I hear all of the time. Um, so that's, I, I think it's a, it's just a very good suggestion that uh, I, I haven't uh, yet heard, but I do see it coming out of the U.S., especially as they begin to grapple with the uh, enormous challenge in the U.S. military of it, it huge, vast uh, data sets that don't exist anywhere else that are largely heterogeneous. Uh, and yet they uh, have given themselves the goal of structuring them all in a unified way and then uh, creating uh, interoperability as well as joint all domain command and control paradigms on top of it, incredibly difficult. Uh, and it's even more difficult when you then add uh, coalition members and NATO members to that entire scheme of joint all domain command and control based on a common data platform and common data languages. Um, so Robert and Nick, I see you sort of, uh, Robert looks uh, a little bit concerned about that. And, and Nick, you're smiling and because uh, I think that you understand these problems. Where do you see that, uh, that data issue, that heterogeneity of data issue uh, getting in the way of innovation, uh, both from an allied perspective and from a larger perspective? 
No, I, I think that's a great question. You know, your reference of, you know, uh, JADC2 or CJADC2 at this point, and a lot of the work that the Jake's been doing, uh, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, are really foundational for where we need to go going forward. And to kind of the point around what's NATO's role in this, at the end of the day, as I kind of said a couple answers ago, NATO really ha can be a forcing function and a coordinating function for a lot of the work that needs to be done here. And organizations like the Net NATO Standardization Office have a lot of experience in dealing with these kind of issues because at the end of the day there's two things that we need to agree on from basically a, a NATO or an alliance-wide standpoint that's how we are going to deal with this data and then also how are we going to compare it across the alliance because at, at the end of the day as we look as the shift of great power competition we're facing very large adversaries and in one case uh, obviously China being one of the most populous countries in the world that have a command and control economy and innovation side, if you want to call it that, that is much more directed. So what NATO can do really is help set these standards based on frameworks such as JADC2 or some evolution thereof, but, and or the common foundation from the Jake, and really export that across all of the NATO allies. Because at the end of the day, standardization and interoperability are going to be key. You look at the European theater and the challenges that have identified in war game after war game of working between the militaries and coordinating all aspects of operations, and that's going to be the biggest value to provide is here are the standards, to Rob's point earlier, for countries who may not be able or don't have the bandwidth to develop them, providing those pre canned standards and really helping them not start from zero but start from a solid platform where they can be interoperable or at least communicate better early at a much earlier stage rather than trying to plug and play at a lot later point. And I think this goes actually to a bigger point that we may not have time to get into today, but I think it's really key. And you know, Rob mentioned before, and Patrick, you alluded to, to the high cost budget items in here. We still, as an alliance and from a U.S. national standpoint, as well as, you know, the U.K., et cetera, all still operate from very much a platform-centric mindset, you know, from a European standpoint, be it FCAS, uh, the Tempest as well, that we're focusing on these very big multi-mission platforms that, at the end of the day, are still have a long development timeline ahead of them. They're taking up very large swaths of both U.S. and European budgets to develop these, and they're going to be increasingly vulnerable to the kind of new tools of war that we've seen, basically the disposable U.S. out there swarms, uh, be it more advanced cyber techniques, as well as area denial weapons as well. So how do we move from that platform-centric mindset to more of a system of systems where we are constantly, like a Lego, being able to add and mix pieces in rather than continuing to come these bespoke multi-mission platforms. And that, I think, is actually the biggest overarching shift here that we have not really addressed, but that is going to be critical for both U.S. and NATO success going forward. Patrick, I wonder okay. if I can just I want step to up up in, uh, yeah. just come back with Please regards to the point about data, because it's an absolutely critical point. Okay. Many, many of these new technologies, which um, venture capitalists and so on and so forth get involved in, as Sylvia said, uh, are, are pretty much based on um, having access to, to high quality data. And, and we just need to just take a step back and just understand a little bit about um, how we got to where we are now. So very briefly, in the first industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution created uh, the way in which we work because it created specialization. And so we have lots of silos and hierarchies um, and all doing a job that is built upon efficiency. It's all about maximizing efficiency. And so as a result, you had silos. And indeed, within the military, the idea of a core, a division, a brigade, so on and so forth, um, that came from Napoleon, and it came from that first industrial revolution. And it was to try and harness um, all of the uh, industrial power that came from that. We are now in 2020, and we need to break out of those silos from a data perspective and to Sylvia's point, uh, and to Nicholas's in fact, have a, a flat data structure um, across the alliance, which then has various APIs, which um, takes us out of our silos and into one area, and has small teams that are task focused on whatever it might be, whatever it is, um, leveraging that data for their advantage. My point is, is that um, building very much, and I, I totally concur with what um, Sylvia and Nicholas have said, is that this is not just a technical issue. It's not just about organizing the data, getting it structured, putting in the requisite protocols and so on and so forth, 
uh, to make sure people can, can access whatever. It's not just about that. This brings in organizational change because we are organized for the first industrial revolution. And I say we, I'm talking about most large organizations, public and private. And yet we are living in the fourth industrial revolution. And until we change that organizational uh, element, it's going to be very, very difficult, I think, to genuinely exploit uh, the potential and opportunity that comes with uh, such a rich data source. Wonderful. Uh, so I want to remind everybody about the poll. Please participate in the poll. We've got a little bit of time left for you to do that. We do have another audience question uh, from Jordan Sweeney. How does the innovation unit deal with the issue of differing capabilities within the alliance? How do you encourage progress in nations that are already leaders in tech without creating an even bigger gap between the tech leaders and those member states who lag behind on the innovation front? Okay, well, just very, very briefly. Um, fundamentally, that is an incredibly key question because it's about interop maintaining interoperability, which actually is a bit of a technical word, but we're actually talking about being able to maximize our deterrence posture. Because if we're not interoperable, it undermines deterrence. Okay, so these two things are fairly critical. Um, what we need to be understanding is, first of all, um, what is it as an alliance we wish to be able to, to do um, at, a, at a strategic level? And that's fairly well articulated in our strategic concept. And then do we have the right tools to be able to actually do that? And as, as nations move and develop and create their own capabilities at different speeds, which is to be expected, um, we have to try to make sure that uh, not only these new technologies are factored in and we kind of make sure that the legacy equipment is able to function with these new technologies, and also when we're doing exercises, that this sort of activity is certified and verified um, within NATO. So we, we actually have a way of measuring um, how effective that is. So this is something which uh, we think about very, very frequently. Um, it's it's right at the center, really, of, of what we're here for. Um, so it's, it's very much um, key, really, to the sort of strategic elements of the alliance with regards to deterrence. Sylvie, do you have if some I, thoughts on that? Uh, Please. Yeah, so um, I, I think that uh, if we uh, think about, think back to this, um, this let's say, idea of data platform, you could have different nations bring in, and perhaps not all the nations uh, participating in the alliance need to participate in the building of the base. And even the financing problem perhaps could be solved by having, you know, the alliance of the extra capable and extra willing uh, create this base structure that could bear the whole alliance. But then on top of that, you have this API idea where, uh, you know, countries could come with their unique strengths and uh, focus. And therefore, perhaps the, the differences uh, wouldn't become greater because every country has its own strengths. And if not, then we should help them develop them. Uh, that is the strength of the alliance. And so I'm thinking of this base. Uh, there was a question about a European Defence Fund and uh, NATO financing in the previous question that we haven't really touched much upon. But we could see an overlap here in, in you know, both needs and opportunities and perhaps countries like Germany that are amazing with industrial data and virtualization could, could contribute with that to the platform. And, you know, US with its amazing data and organization for the control and command and maybe these high-end platforms virtualization could contribute with that. And so I think that we could play on each other's strengths and maybe we could also bring in this both dual use in terms of civilian and military, but also dual use in terms of nations will have to build this anyway. So we might as well bring some of that created value to the shared table and see how we, you know, use that as a new value creation platform. So um, um, I, I, I think that uh, the, the last point I want to make is that we still think about the investment needs of NATO in, in terms of these um, high-end platforms, things that cost a lot of money, take a terribly long time to develop, you know, the, the, the fastest thing that makes the biggest bang. But maybe the next, uh, you know, big conflict or even the many small conflicts, which are probably more realistic, are going to be won by the guys who deter these things, who make, uh, you know, the situation obfuscated, who, who, do, who use these cyber security tactics uh, and infrastructure attacks. And so I think you really have to understand that, uh, you know, the strategies and long-term strategies also have to 
go from the first industrial revolution that Rob was describing to the fourth industrial revolution? Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's frustrating how uh, it seems like we're not quite there, how we seem to, as all of you have pointed out, we remain wedded to uh, this paradigm of very large platforms of uh, bigger than ever uh, boats and ships and, and uh, long uh, tail, like very long term programs of record, while innovation is happening much closer to the ground, especially in asymmetric settings. Uh, so uh, it, it's helpful, I think, for everyone to hear that uh, <laughs> the direction that information technology is going uh, remains divergent from that paradigm of huge, expensive uh, programs of record that take a very long time to mature. Uh, so that seems to be a, a resounding theme here. Um, I think we have time to uh, announce this poll uh, and see what the poll results are. So uh, if, let's see if that can, can, can come up and let's see uh, how people answered the poll. You might be having some trouble with it. Hold on. What was the question? Oh, um, well, I'm not sure. We don't yet have uh, results for the studio. So uh, we hope to have them soon. But uh, with that, we're actually out of time. I want to thank Rob, uh, Sylvia, and Nicholas for joining me here today. Uh, and I want to uh, tell the audience, thank you as well for uh, taking part in this discussion. I think we learned a whole lot. Uh, please stick around. We're going to have closing remarks from Globesec CEO, John Barter. Uh, and thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening to those in Europe, good afternoon to those in the UK, good morning to those in America, and in Asia, it's either a late night or a very early morning for you. Thank you for everyone who's still with us at the end of the NATO private sector dialogues. As mentioned, this partnership between NATO and Globsec aims at bringing together the private sector closer to NATO and jointly explore the ways in which our security landscape evolves and what type of responses are needed. We heard today a number of expert insights, concerns, policy recommendations, and questions that still need an answer. As the Deputy Secretary General, Joanna said, we need to prepare today to maintain the technical edge for tomorrow, and we need the whole of a society approach involving not only governments and international organizations, but also the private sector and academia. We also heard that NATO's dominance has been challenged. These new technologies are coming, if we like it or not. It's not about one technology, it's the sheer speed that is daunting. Technology is moving forward ahead of policy. EU's NATO's shared values are an excellent starting point for cooperation in AI. We need to make sure our values are at the center of technological development and implementation. We need to develop gone off, the ecosystems across the alliance, innovative financing and partnering with both big and small companies in the private sector. The biggest challenge remains how to ensure strategic and meaningful and cooperation between public, private sector, both big and small, academia and civil society. With these conclusions in mind, we are wrapping up today's conference, but not before announcing that today was just the first step of this new partnership initiated by NATO with Globsec. Throughout the next six months, we will continue engaging with the private sector in smaller sized dialogues on the following themes. The private sector's contribution to alliance security, green innovation in defense, the future of the internet in a contested geopolitical environment, transatlantic cooperation on ethical deployment and governance of new technologies, critical infrastructure and security of supply chains. A quick message to the participants from the private sector. Please feel free to recommend speakers for these up and coming dialogues. There will be more information to come. Please follow our Globsec website and social media for updates. I would like to end by thanking NATO for trusting Globsec as a partner in this endeavor. 
I would like to thank all the speakers and moderators for joining the conversations and for sharing their views on the topics we discussed this afternoon. We hope our audience enjoyed this experience as much as us. And lastly, a shout out to both the Globsec and NATO team, members who worked so closely together to prepare to today's conference. I think we can all agree they did a terrific job. Before I leave, do not forget the Grey Rhino. She's high impact and she's on her way, a bit like Globsec. Have a good evening, everyone, and we'll be in touch very soon.